Now we are recording. All right, we are going about to go live on Facebook as well. Um, to this discussion about what's going on. Okay. 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 And we are preparing to go live. Awesome. You come back here and thank you for your patience as we are setting up everything just to make sure that we are flowing live and we will get started momentarily. Thank you everyone for your patience. All right. We have 17 participants in the room. We appreciate you uh, for joining. Let's see. You let's go ahead and let people in. All right. Um, let me right. Hello, sir. How are you? Okay. Yes, sir. I, I'm. I'm. I'm letting you everyone in right now. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. All right, all right. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Thank you for joining. We appreciate you all for coming on in. Uh, if you can uh, make sure your mics are muted. We are also live on Facebook. I'm, I'm seeing that we're live. So want to make sure that we are indeed live on Facebook uh, to make sure that we can flow. All right. So let's see if... Um, I know Ms. Mary's on, if you can let me know if we're flowing on Facebook as well. I believe we are, but I just wanted to double check to make sure that we are good to go. All right. So once again, we appreciate everyone for joining. Uh, we're very grateful that you are here. My name is David Derek Bryant. Derek David Bryant, that's who I am. Just wanna make sure we're good to go and flowing on Facebook. All right, so we are good on Facebook as well. I see me on the screen. So let us begin. It's 504. Thank you for your patience uh, as we are getting things going. You all, we are in a, a great time. Happy holidays to you all. Uh, we're excited to be bringing this uh, important discussion to you all here live on Facebook and also in Zoom. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to let us know. Um, you can type your questions in the chat. I already see one person has already begun to chat. My wife, I said Facebook is up and running, so thank you for that. Please utilize the chat if you just want to talk amongst yourselves. Um, also, if you have a question um, for any of the panelists, what I would like for you to do to separate the question from the chat is if you have a question, type the word question first and then type your question. Once again, if you have a question for any of the panelists, uh, any of the discussion going on, please be sure to type the word question and then I type your question, if that makes sense. So for example, let's say I have a question for David. I'll type question, David, is your real name David or is it Derek, right? What's your real name, right? So then I'll be able to uh, answer and we'll make sure we get uh, the answers to all the questions just as best and as soon as possible, okay? All right, so welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, Black Voices in Caldwell County. I am the host and moderator. My name is David Bryant and I'm excited to be bringing this discussion to you all. Uh, we are excited that you are here to join us. We have a vast array of panelists that have been assembled today to bring you something very important. We tried to make sure that we got panelists that were um, in some kind of way touching Caldwell County. Okay, there are many people who are either uh, lifelong residents of Caldwell County, people who have worked in Caldwell County, uh, people who have... Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to also be the host as well. People who, who have lived in Caldwell County or some ways touching the Caldwell County area. So we appreciate you. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. Let's go over some rules of engagement. Okay. So we want to make sure by first and foremost, want to make sure that we're being respectful. Okay. We're going to talk about some things. And as I was sharing earlier with uh, some of the panelists, a lot has happened. And when trauma happens, when 
different things happen, it's important that we talk, have a conversation as a family, that we don't just sweep everything under the rug and hope that we heal and bless them in Jesus' name and things are going to go on. It's important that we have a dialogue and a conversation. And today, as a Black community, we're having a conversation. Now, everyone is welcome to join the conversation. Um, we have people that are, are off of all different ethnicities, and that is encouraged and welcome. You see, we wanted to have a discussion for the Black community, but we want to make sure that everyone can be partakers and hear what's going on. I want to remind you all that we want to be respectful. So I might not agree with what you, what you say, or you may not agree with what I say, but at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we can agree to disagree, okay? I do want to also say strongly that if you are listening on this call today, if you're part of this call, whether on Facebook or even especially Zoom, if your intent is to bring harm, to destroy someone's reputation, business, whatever they're doing, if you're here to just out of maliciousness, we ask you to get off the call. Now, we want you to join, we want you to listen, but if your intent is to do harm, then maybe this is not the conversation for you. Maybe you can listen in the replay, okay? Because we want everyone, everyone to be respectful. Now, if you're just here curious and you have questions, fine, by all means, you're welcome. Hear my heart. The thing is, we don't want to tear people down. We don't want to destroy. Don't get me wrong. At the same time, we will also be sharing our truths. We will be talking from a, some, some of us will be speaking from a place of hurt, some of us from pain, some of us just raw truth that we've experienced from our own. You see, my perspective may not be your perspective, but I believe it's important that we see the situation from different viewpoints, okay? So I hope that this will be a robust conversation. I hope that you ask questions. I, I pray that the panelists will be able to share information. At the same time, I do want to remind you that this is we're only scratching the surface. Uh, each panelist will have about 10 minutes to talk about their topics, okay? 10 minutes to, to kind of share what's on their heart regarding their particular topic. Okay, I'm going to share my screen shortly. We're going to show you the list that we're going to be talking about things in, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so once again, we have about 10 minutes per topic. We might go over, might, might go under, but about 10 minutes, and then we'll go on. At the end, once all the panelists have shared from the different topics, then we'll open things up for a conversation. We'll open things up even for broader questions and everyone can kind of uh, submit their questions in the chat. So once again, if you have a question that pops in your head for any reason, okay, make sure you type question and then be able to uh, uh, type your question. That will help our, our, our people behind the scene categorize the questions so they can feed them and ask them later on as a broad, uh, broader audience, okay? With that said, um, let us, I want to do something really quickly. Now, because I'm the host and because, hey, uh, I get to do this, we're going to uh, open in prayer, okay? Well, what, what do you mean? Yeah, well, if, if, if it offends you, I'm sorry, but we're going to pray, okay? So we can make sure that we get things started. All right, so we appreciate you. Here we go. Dear God, we thank you for this discussion. God, we thank you that you are in the room. We thank you that you will lead and guide and bring understanding. Father, if there's anything that will try to, anybody trying to cause confusion, we cancel that in Jesus' name. We thank you that each panelist will be able to share from their expertise. That us that are listening will be able to get a different perspective. We'll be able to bring about another understanding. So one, we can heal. Two, we can have an understanding of what's going on. And three, we can all gather on the same page. Help us, God, to, to uh, be able to get an understanding and to be able to walk away inspired, empowered, motivated, and knowing how to take this information back to our homes, back to our community, back to our city, back to our school, back so we can make a big, bigger and better impact in our community. Father, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So thank you for allowing me to pray. Uh, and so we appreciate that. And so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and we're going to share our first topic here in a second. Let me share my screen really quickly so you kind of have an agenda. I know if you're at church, right, or you're invited to speak on a panel for anywhere, you want to know, what's the order of service? Am I just sitting here? What's going on, right? What's the order of service? When are they going to get to the good part? When are they going to get to that part? All right. So with that said, I got you. I got you. So we want to make sure we, we show you the order of events, how things will be flowing. All right. So on the screen right now, you, you can see more or less how we're going to flow today. 
We're going to talk about the introduction and house rules, which I just gave you, and I'll highlight once more. Then from there, we're going to have the uh, Mr. Homer Williams and Ms. Shirley Williams are going to be able to share Black history in Caldwell County. Afterwards, we're going to talk about 2020 in Caldwell County, things that have happened this year that have been earth-shattering for us in our community and across the nation. Then we're going to deal with mental health in the Black community, and that's going to be brought on by Ms. Wanda Holland. We're also going to have Reverend, Fritz, Reverend Dr. Fritz Williams and Reverend Sean Rivers share about faith and religion. After that, we're going to have an illustrious, uh, awesome young lady graduate from um, Lockhart High School. She's going to share about education and the Black community. Then we have a special guest on that's going to be talking about early childhood uh, intervention, Ms. Tanaya Martin. Followed by that, we have community leadership. Uh, we have Ms. Jackie Campbell uh, out of Lewing. And then we're going to just close things out with a, a good friend of mine, uh, Sabri Zuper, uh, uh, our health specialist, is going, to be, is going to be sharing some things about health in the Black community, even touching a little bit about COVID, okay? So that's the order of events. I hope you see it. Hope you're good to go. And that's where we're going to be coming from, okay? So I hope we're on the same page. We're about to get started. Just want to tell you how things are going to flow, how things are going to run. If you have questions, please feel free to type them in to the chat below and also on Facebook, same thing. If you're watching via Facebook and you're watching live and you see the live button, you can go ahead and type question and type your question in the chat. And we'll make sure that we get it to the panelists at the appropriate time. Once again, I'm David Bryan. I'm your host for this event. We appreciate you joining us for this very important conversation. I think we covered everything. Um, Want to make sure, again, we're speaking from a place of, of education, a place of truth. Now, sometimes the truth hurts, okay? Sometimes the truth hurts, and we want to make sure uh, that you respect the truth that's coming out, okay? Uh, but I believe that everyone is on the call for the greater good of our community. So we appreciate that. So without further ado, we're going to get ready to add and, and speak with um, the Williams family, uh, Mr. Homer, and, uh, and, and Ms. Uh, Shirley Williams. Let me share this really quickly with, about them. I think I have it. Let's see, click on here. There we go. We're going to get ready to, to hear from Mr. Homer, Ms. Shirley Williams, uh, here in, in our community, uh, a former military veteran. I mean, their, their resume speaks for themselves. Many of you know who they are, former educator, lifelong residents here in Caldwell County, and we want to be able to have a great conversation with, uh, with the Williams family. So I thank you for everyone. Also, make sure that, you, that your microphone is on mute. Uh, unless it's your turn to speak as a panelist, that will help things flow just a little bit better with the audio. So um, the Williams family, Mr. Homer Williams and Ms. Shirley Williams, you're more than welcome to take your uh, to take your microphone off mute. We're going to have about 10 minutes to share. I'm setting the timer now so we can kind of keep the conversation moving. But Williams family, how are you doing? Good evening. Doing, doing well. I'm fine. Good, good, good. Thank you so, so much for being on this uh, discussion today. Every time I speak to you all, I don't speak to you all often, but I believe when we speak, it's a divine and uh, it's, I, I walk away learning so much from you all just with the wisdom and even things here in Caldwell County. Uh, so I do have a question for you all. Um, if you can share, growing up in Caldwell County, how were things for you? Kind of give a little bit of history about black history in Caldwell County from your perspective. I even know you you all have so much history within you all. If you just kind of share a little bit about growing up in Caldwell County, how things were for you, and we'll just kind of take it from there. Does that work for you all? That work. Awesome. I grew up basically in the, the southern part of Caldwell County, Luling, Texas. I went to school in Luling, Texas for six years at the uh, Rosenwald School uh, there in Luling. And then, uh, uh, I guess, working around with my father, he was a farmer and what have you. I learned uh, a lot about the farm working stuff. And then moving to Lockhart in 1952, uh, I guess I learned more. I was a little bit older. Went to school here for six years and then graduated. But growing up, uh, I guess life sometimes if you don't know, you don't know until you learn. Yes, so, sir. <clears throat> my biggest thing was when I left Lulu was to be able to play in a band. So we tried out and uh, I wanted to be a saxophonist. And I did good in my music. 
department there, but then when we got the lockout, there was no music department. We didn't have one, so I played football. And uh, did pretty good playing football. Baseball, I was a pitcher. And uh, normal life, family life, we were living on the southern part of Cal Caldwell County, what, what is called Muddy Acres. And in that day and time, we had no automobile. So my mother worked as a domestic maid. And uh, she had to get up, rain, shine, sleet, or snow, and walk to work every day over on the west side of town. And uh, <clears throat> we had to walk to school the same way. And uh, now children who live in that area, they can ride a bus, but it said if you live within a mile of the school, you couldn't ride a bus. I don't know whether it was a mile or not, but I cut through the country, through the streets, through the woods, down the hill, and everything to get to school on time. It was kind of a hard matter to get to school on time when you got uh, uh, three other siblings in the house with you and uh, you don't have a bathroom for multiple people. So I was always the last one to leave home. <laughs> I was, I was uh, late getting to school, but I never was tardy. <laughs> <laughs> I would run and all that kind of stuff, but I made it on, on time. And uh, having done that and graduated in 1958, I uh, went to work for the U University of Texas in Austin and uh, worked there for about three years. And I decided I was going to change my career and, and uh, worked as a carpenter, helper for Thompson and Bright, who was carpenters here in Lockhart, Texas. And then I went to the military in 1961. Stayed in the military until 1964. Coming out of the military, I had to make a decision on make my own life and try to do the best that I could with those who would accept me on the job that I went on. And uh, after a couple of years, I decided as well, I think I need to get married, you know. And so I got married to my wife here, Shirley Williams, in 1965, December the 31st. And uh, we're coming up on 55 years. Shouldn't have told me. <laughs> Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. Thank let, me, you. let me ask you all a question. So being mayor for 55 years since 1965, and Mr. Williams growing up in 1958, a military, going to work with UT and, and, and many things, uh, what was the environment like? I, I You said something that was that kind of struck me, that you got a job kind of wherever you could. And for me in history, 1965 and 1964, I was kind of pertinent years with LBJ, the war in poverty, I mean, different things like, like that. What was the climate like? My understanding is things weren't the best for us as African Americans uh, um, coming, you know, with being fresh, kind of Jim Crow and di di different things like that. Can you share a little bit about that? I know you didn't let that stop you, but if you can kind of paint a picture, what was things like for you all living in that in the world, but also here locally as well? How was things like locally for you all as uh, African Americans? Mostly, uh you had to take farm jobs, you know, pick cotton, chop cotton, and uh, pull broom corn and stuff like that. You had to, you were on the lowest end. If you were needed, yeah, you could work, but if you weren't needed, then there was no job really for you. So you had to hang where you could. You pick up a con, you, you did uh, peanut shaking and uh, all of that stuff, haul of hay and what have you. And uh, then uh, things maybe got a little bit better uh, after I did that for a while and I worked for Goodyear for a while. But then every time you look at your pay scale, you got a minimum wage pay scale and everybody else got a good pay scale. So <clears throat> I talked around on jobs. I went to IRS and I worked for them for a while and I found out I qualified for jobs, but I couldn't have them, but I could train others, you know, and I thought it was something wrong with that. So 
I thought that was a time for me to let that go and see if I could find something different. So I went in the construction field and uh, it was pretty good. And then when I wanted to be a carpenter, things worked pretty good for the first few jobs. And then uh, they come up against you, what you gonna do with the money? You know, where well, you hadn't had no money in, in ages, what do you think I'm gonna do with it? I'm gonna first try to get a place to live and take care of myself and family. And uh, they always, you know, have that uh, thought that you're gonna go get drunk, you know? Well, drunk is the furthest thing from your mind when, you, when, you, when you're poor and you're trying to make a living. So I worked construction for 20 years and uh, will become very successful. And then from there, I went to the U.S. Post Office and I worked another 20 years. And after working there another 20 years, sometime doubling up, uh, I decided that I was going to retire when I got 70 years old, and I retired. And I've been retired now about uh, 11 years. Wow. Awesome. And, Congratulations. Uh, yeah, that, that perseverance, you know, from going and uh, not taking no for, for an answer and being, being uh, you know, know what you want, you know, know what you want for your family. So awesome. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's that's great. And and, and Miss Williams, I know uh, your husband. You know, finding the love of your life from 1965 and being together and having raising wonderful children and and on the journey. How have, has things been for you? I know you worked as an educator and you've seen some, I guess, some unfairness in the system and and you know uh, having the skills, being a wonderful teacher, but maybe couldn't advance like your husband talked about because the pay may have be, been different just because of the color of your skin. Or can you share a little bit in the next? couple minutes how was things for you in the education realm and your work and your experience thank you brother brian for inviting us to come along and do this now my husband left some things out my husband does have a business degree from nixon clay clay college which was the only really form of college that uh, i guess african americans could really go to and get some type of education uh and also he does have one from uh, was community college in, uh, so he left out a lot of stuff, but he has been very industrious and very, he just really had persevered on making sure that he didn't, didn't sell. Yes. He just didn't sell for not being able to have all of that, that we felt like we could have had. But I am, I was born and raised in Dale, Texas, which is in Caldwell County. And I am 70 plus years old. And the thing, I think you may have heard some of my stories with Brian, but I look at it, I was raised uh, as family. I live very close to my grandparents, my family and I, we all of us live kind of close together. And we had a lot of teaching. Now, I started the school in Dale at four years old in a one room little schoolhouse where there were all sets of children in the country going to school. I'm making sure and then uh, it was integrated in 19, not integrated, but it was closed down in the 50s when they built Carver Elementary here, Carver Kindergarten here in Lockhart. So we were bused from there to school. Now, as my growing, I'll go back. As growing up in Caldwell County, uh, in Dale, we everybody was family. It was like a village. Everybody could raise each other's children that they saw they were getting out of the norm of the way that they were raised. And my grandfather was a farmer. My daddy worked on the railroad, and my mother stayed at home pretty much. My daddy didn't care if we worked or not, but my mother said, my children gonna learn how to work. So when we grew up, that was a trailer come through. My daddy went to Houston to work on the railroad. So my mother said, my children gonna learn how to work. So that was a cotton trailer. People going to pull cotton, to pick cotton was coming through that. And she said, in the morning, everybody's gonna be ready. We're going to pull, we, you're gonna learn how to work today. So we said, oh, where's daddy? Daddy, why did you have to go to Houston? We wouldn't have to go pull cotton because we had heard how hard it was. So that's pretty much how it was. Then we were, uh, it's hard to get all this in a little bit. 
time. But that's how it was me growing up in Dale. We didn't have a really hard life in Dale. We didn't know a whole lot of things about what was going on in, in Lockhart until we really started getting our cars and going to Lockhart. We knew about the seg we heard about segregation, but we never worried about it growing up because we had everything we need right there where we lived in Dale. And we were all like family. If one, the very first person who got a TV in Lockhart, I mean in Dale, we all seemed to have had a TV because she would get out and call, hey, come on over, such and such is on, everybody come. We would go and be in all a house full of children in there watching TV. So we were really raised, not really that complicated for us because we were right there well, we had everything we felt like, so we didn't really know. But once I did grow up and go to start going to school and, and Lockhart, and then I really learned a lot about how hard it must be. I felt like in Lockhart because yeah. I didn't see a lot where we yeah. were because we were just happy running around, well taught by my grandfather telling us, look, you don't go around begging people for nothing. You don't eat at everybody's house blah, 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 because you get out and work, get your education. He couldn't read or write, but he was focused on everybody getting an education. Yes, ma'am. And that and that's important. You know, uh, sorry if I interrupt you, just, that's important. Everyone getting that education, I mean, that's what we hear. Uh, we've heard that getting an education is important. And I believe one of the reasons, like, you know, your, uh, your elder sharing, you know, don't go eat, eat everyone everyone's house, do this, do that. Part of that, and from my perspective, my limited lens was safety for you all as well. Making mm -hmm. sure that you get home safe, making mm -hmm. sure that you don't have anyone who will see you and that doesn't know the family that will try to uh, um, cause you harm, you know, part of, of the safety for the family. So uh, we appreciate that. Unfortunately, stay, stay on the line if you will, because we're going to have some more <laughs> questions for you. Thank William's you. family, uh, it's only a brief snippet. I mean, yeah, I would love I to know. have like three, four, five hours with you all. <laughs> Uh, you guys are amazing, uh, have some awesome story, awesome history from Dale to Lockhart to Caldwell County to the slave, the, the, from St. John Colony, the slave land that was given. So there's so much that you all have to share. So don't go too far. If you can okay. stay on the call. Okay. I'm going to stay on the script as much as I can. If not, you stop me like you're doing right now. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We appreciate that. Now, with okay. that said, with that said, we're going to have to uh, transition to another topic. Uh, and so, um, which is, uh, but we want you to come back and, and share. So we're going to move on to another topic just to kind of update. That way we can kind of get things going and, and keep things uh, moving so we can uh, uh, carry the conversation. Like I said, it's a lot of information. And you know, we're trying to do a smorgasbord and stuff everything in, but we're only scratching the surface because this conversation is needed from history, 1958, from the before being married 55 years, being raised uh, uh, from even when 1923, when the Confederate monument was put here, the KKK was uh, very prevalent in, in our community, our region. So mm -hmm. kind of being in that, knowing history that was happening, but knowing how you all had to live. What was, uh, how you all, you all had to stay safe and the education and so forth, what was going on? So thank you for sharing because it's so valuable for the conversation. So we appreciate you, appreciate you, Williams family. Thank you so much. And so we'll come back for some questions for you on the back end. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank okay, you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, wow, wow, wow. So uh, I just wanted to get popcorn and start eating. It is, it is, you know, you know, sometimes you're laying down, you put your feet up in the air, you're laying on your tummy, and you're like this. That's what I wanted to do, but because they have so much to share, wow, and I'm, I'm a wow. student of history, so thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, if everyone can continue to make sure that your mics are muted, we're going to move on to our next guest. If they are on, all right, that's my timer going off. We're going to move on to our next guest. Uh, if they are on. If not, we'll keep things moving. Just want to make sure that we're in line with our conversation and keep things moving along with the program. So our, our next topic of discussion, we're going to be talking about 2020 in Caldwell County. 2020, from what happened as the, uh, the Williams family shared about some uh, this daily life and about how, how things were, weren't fair as far as pay, how this family, how you can kind of, everyone was everyone, everyone's family, you can discipline each other, right? You knew what was going on. There was safety. 
There were some unfair advantages, but family was important, as you heard. Now, this year, we've heard some things about uh, with COVID-19, but not only that, with the social injustice, with unrest going on, with uh, from uh, from Ahmaud Arbery to George Floyd, even to the most recent uh, Breonna Taylor, and the list goes on and on and on. We've heard a lot. So if uh, Ms. Hattie Carter or Mr. Sterling uh, Riles, if you're on, if you can um, mute yourself at this time, we have uh, some questions for you. I uh, want to make sure that you have some time to speak about some important topics. So if you're on, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, and I will try to pin uh, your, uh, your information to the top of the screen. So let's see. Bear with me for a second. All right. And... We're good to go. So if, if you're on, we'll, uh, we'll give you way to speak. If not, I'll share some things and we'll move on to our next topic. Um, one of the reasons we reached out to Mr. Sterling Riles, uh, I, I actually, I, I know Sterling from when I was a young, young boy, our, our paths crossed, our parents, we knew each other from back in the day. And so anyway, I, I ran back into him and some of you may have seen him on social media uh, here back in June, July, August, being very vocal about his stance and his passion and the way he felt concerning the Confederate monument. You all know that came, well, that's always been a concern uh, for people of color, for black people. Uh, some of us just got used to it, it's, it's there. For some, it was a symbol of hate. For some, it was just a symbol to honor the Confederate soldiers. Uh, but many knew where it was coming from. Many knew why it was put there. And so uh, across America, people began to uh, make petitions and, and, and vote and, and work on removing the monument. And so um, that happened locally as well. Our Miss Hattie's on Facebook and couldn't get into Zoom. Miss Hattie, if you can type in some comments on Facebook um, and we'll share that on the Zoom platform as well. Uh, Miss Hattie, if you can share just a little blurb about what's going on with the Carver School, uh, that would be helpful. And so coming back to the Confederate monument, we all know that came to a head in, locally in Caldwell County. Uh, and so it went to the commissioner's court where people spoke on keeping the Confederate monument where it was at or removing that. And for, I don't want to put words into Sterling's, uh, Sterling's mouth, but um, he, he spoke very passionately about what it meant to him. And so that's why we invited him to be on. But I, I too spoke about why it needed to be removed. I too spoke about, well, to be honest, I didn't think, I didn't know anything much about it until I did my history, until I did some digging until I found out about why it was put there, until I found out about who put it there, the Daughters of the Confederacy and what they stood for and how they were arm in arm with the Ku Klux, the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan and so forth. And, and uh, I became a proponent of, you know what? I don't think it should be there. So I too spoke on behalf of that. And to give you an update where things sit now. So fast forward, there were people speaking for it. There were people speaking against it. And so um, with that said, I see a comment coming in about Carver. But with that said, at the end of the day, it was voted to have it removed. The commissioner's court decided to send it to a committee. A committee met, and the committee said, look, let's have it removed. And not, let's not just throw it away. Let's not just tear it down, as some have done in other cities, other states. But let's go ahead and move it to the Caldwell County. I forgot to put my timer. Let's go ahead and move it to the Caldwell County Museum. And so that's the process where it's at now. It went before a historical committee and word got back that yes, it can be moved. Uh, and a bid was given out and a bid was received back this past week saying that, look, we, we can move it. A company, one company said, we'll move it, but it's gonna cost close to $28,000. Now, local uh, um, activists and leaders have raised money. There's been about $8,000 raised. There's a Facebook campaign. I didn't do it, but uh, local activists came together and they worked hard to make sure that it, it, uh, monies were raised. We thought we needed 8,000, that's what was raised. But there's much more that's needed. So as of right now, where it sits, I believe it's gonna go out for another bid to see if we can get another bid lower than 28,000. If not, then hopefully the community can raise that. But as it sits now in another 30 days, I believe, or next month or two, it'll go out for another bid to see if there's more companies that wanna bid on behalf of removing the Confederate monument from the county, uh, Caldwell County Courthouse and moving it to the Caldwell County Museum. So um, yes, ma'am, I see a comment, we will raise it. I believe that too. If it comes down to the only bid, that will be the only bid being $28,000, then we as a community can raise that, I believe that. What was said was, 
because private funds, the Dollars of the Confederacy, they put that there in 1923 with their private funds, then private funds need to move it. So that's where things sit. That's an update as of uh, the last couple of days. So I wanted to make sure we had an update to share with you concerning uh, the, uh, the, the Confederate monument. All right. Uh, and move with the with the addition of a plaque. I, yes, uh, Mr. Lee Russ talks about there, there will be a plaque. Also, giving some historical context to why it was removed and 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 so forth. So yes, that's being worked on as well. Um, I don't see a comment from Miss Hattie Carter, so I will share some things very briefly that I know about what's going on. Um, I've been working alongside with Miss Hattie. I know she's on Facebook uh, watching as well. And so basically, she has come together. Just as a community leader, she came and said, look, because she lives right down the road from the historical Carver School, if I'm not mistaken, um, I think uh, Mr. Homer Williams, if I'm not, not mistaken, I was told that you might have graduated from Carver High School in 1958. Is that correct, sir? And so um, if that is, that's, that's, I mean, we have so many people that went to Carver. That was the black school in, in our area. Okay, and so Miss Hattie Carter, because she's right down the street, because she's had family members that graduated and so forth, she said, look, there's always been a, there's always been an effort to try to, to try to re restore Carver, but it's kind of dwindled down for whatever reason. Now there's a movement, volunteers coming, even yesterday, volunteers met at the school yesterday to do some renovations, some cleaning on the outside and doing things like that. There was funds donated, uh, Central Texas Refuse, uh, they donated a trash can. So a lot of things are happening and the ball is moving. So community members, we need your help. So if you can go to the Historical Carver School on Facebook, I believe it's called the Historical Carver School, just type it on Facebook. You can find out more information about when the next time is that the community will come together sometime in January to, uh, to make sure that we are taking step by step in line with city officials, the city building, building inspector as well, make sure that we're taking the right steps to restore uh, Carver School to, to something that can be used for the community. Also, I know Mr. Michael Anderson is on the uh, watching as well. Thank you, sir, for all that you're doing in that effort as well. So ladies and gentlemen, that was a quick update with what's going on in Caldwell County 2020. I do wanna say this as we get ready to invite uh, Ms. Wanda Holland to, to jump on, uh, to be a panelist in about three minutes. If you recall back in June, there was a noose found hanging um, in a church in, in St. John College, Zion Church. And I wanted to make sure we got an update because that was very, a very egregious act, a very hateful act. Wanted to find out where we sit with that. So I called the sheriff's, uh, sheriff's department and as we sit, uh, that's been turned over to the FBI. There has not been an individual name uh, who did that. Uh, there's been things here, this and that, but as we sit, that's an investigation that the FBI is underseeing. So I wanted to make sure we had some kind of update on that and that's where things sit. So 2020 in Caldwell County, it had, had some challenges, but also good things happening in the black community and, and from the community from people of color as well. Once again, we, this is a, a conversation that we're having with the black community, but everyone is affected for the good and bad by what's going on. So uh, with that said, we're gonna get ready to move on and talk about mental health. Uh, as we do so, I want to make sure that we share, I'm going to uh, share my screen really quickly and we're gonna invite Ms. Wanda Holland here in a second to be a panelist as well. Um, and she is a former Caldwell County resident, has 30 plus years here in the, in, uh, of experience in social work uh, with mental health and helping uh, coach uh, individuals to be their very best selves, okay? Uh, she's a master trainer. By the way, she's also available for trainings. Uh, so she has a whole library full of trainings that she can do for businesses, for individuals, for organizations, nonprofits. So feel free to uh, to use her in the future as well. Um, but Ms. Wanda, I'm going to uh, say this, and I'm going to uh, pin you to the screen as well as we get ready to invite you on. Um, let's see. All right. So there we are. Uh, I want to say this, Ms. Wanda from a black man uh, going through 2020, my mental health was affected. Just seeing everything played out on TV, seeing George Floyd played out. I'm breaking down and me crying because I realized that's somebody who looks like me. That could have been me from even last two weeks ago, seeing uh, Casey Goodson, how he was walking 
was home with a Subway sandwich. And before he made it in, he was shot for whatever reason. And his, his little brother and grandma, they, they saw him laying in the threshold, uh, you know, collapse. That plays an effect on your mental health. If you can share some things about that, how we as a community can work on mental health from your perspective and whatever else, even with the criminal justice system as well, which you have, uh, you have knowledge in. If you can share about that, and we have about 10, 12 minutes or so, and then we'll move on to the next topic. So you have the floor, ma'am. Beautiful, thank you so much. Can you all hear me all right? Is my audio okay? Thumbs up? Okay, real good. Well, thank you so much again, uh, David. I appreciate you. Um, and as David mentioned, I have um, quite a few years experience in working with, with people, uh, whether they are juveniles or adults uh, in and out of the criminal justice system, et cetera. So my background is in social work, it's in mental health, it's in education, uh, as well as criminal justice and nonprofit organizations. I am a certified life coach. I do have a master's in social work and I'm currently studying to receive my actual uh, clinical practitioner license in social work uh, as we speak. And one of the things that I wanna point out based on the, the points that you brought out, David, about um, how the 2020 experiences have been affecting mental health for not just people of color or African-Americans, but for all of us, all of us. Uh, however, we are a more vulnerable population uh, in a large degree. And as a matter of fact, the University of Texas Hogg Foundation declares racism as a mental health crisis. And this came out November 20th, 2020, that the Hogg Foundation put that report out. And one of the things that they said is they said that Racism is a mental health issue because racism causes trauma. And what you've described here with George Floyd and we know about Blake, we know about the whole, all of the tragedies, all of the traumas, as well as the pandemic and the layoffs and the loss of income, so many other things, the loss of life, et cetera, uh, from the, the, the viruses really does cause trauma and it impacts us in unique ways, uh, just as it does others. But you know, there's so many other areas that uh, are brought into the fold when it comes to, to our folks. So racial trauma accumulates throughout a person's life. And we heard the, the family before uh, uh, speaking to us that I've been married for 55 years is that the, I believe the Williams family. Um, and so when you go through trauma in life, whether you can only uh, find jobs picking up peanuts or tossing hay or you know, where our wage salaries, uh, you know, scale is so much lower than someone else's, that impacts our lives as well. And then Hawk Foundation went on to say that this trauma uh, is leading to activation of stress responses and hormonal adaptations, increasing the risk of non-communicable diseases as well as biological aging. And so the mental health, is really affecting every single aspect of our lives. Now, one of the things that I wanted to point out about um, trauma and oppression and what we're experiencing right now in 2020 with the, with the pandemic and with so many other um, traumatic experiences to our community, uh, to our families of color, uh, to our black men in particular and how that impacts their their families, their, their parents, their spouses, their children. Uh, I just simply want to say that being oppressed isn't just being a bit poorer than other groups or having a rougher life uh, than the oppressor. But what it does mean is being treated as if you are less of a human being less than they are, is what the message is. And what it does is it infuriates our people and it degrades us. It takes away our sense of humanity. And so that in and of itself oftentimes can cause a psychotic break. It can cause us to experience all kinds of forms of, of psychoses. And there are six different signs of psych psychotic breaks. 
And I just want to bring those out briefly without going into a whole lot of detail. But then, you know, it affects the way we cope. Um, it causes us to become delusional. And again, I want to focus more on our community. Um, when I worked in Caldwell County, I worked with individual and family as an individual and family counselor through Teen Connections. And that was from about 2000 to 2002. And I had the pleasure of being able to make home visits. And I got a chance to know the community fairly well. And one of the things that I appreciated though is the closeness of the community in Lockhart in particular, which is where I worked. I, I worked in Lockhart, Lockhart, but I covered several other counties as well. And the police officers, the local police officers would come by my office and introduce themselves to me. And they made it possible for me to go on rides with them. And I was so grateful for that. And I really felt like they were doing a community service because they gave me a ride and they knew the family so well. They knew about the generational crime. They knew about many of the families that had mental health issues in those families. And they would ride me to various homes and they would literally point homes out to me and say, I want you to go in there and I want you to talk to this family. I want you to go in there and I want you to talk to this student or, or to this person. Uh, these are some of the problems that we're seeing. These are some of the things that we're experiencing. So a lot of folk don't realize how close the police department pays attention actually to the community. And so coming from a small town and from a small county, I really think that it provides an opportunity for a bit more understanding of the culture and of the community in which you're working with. And it may make them less likely to be more brutal or to be more trigger happy because they seem to have gone to school with quite a few uh, of the folk in the community. They also grew up in the community. Uh, they are understanding what's going on in the community. However, we still have systematic, systemic racism, even in mental health. Uh, many of the providers are not culturally aware of what it takes and how to incorporate uh, a mental health treatment into uh, their, their case plans when they're working uh, with people of color. Um, they are not recognizing, or many times if they recognize, they're not incorporating the role of the faith of people of color, uh, the role of the ministry, the role of the church. And now when we have the pandemic, the churches aren't meeting like they were before. Okay, so now there's that disconnect. And when you already have a very delicate community of people uh, who are not receiving the treatment and the care that they need, much because in our community, we still see it as a negative stigma to even admit that we have a mental health problem or a mental health issue, whereas at least 68% of us think that it's a sign of weakness to even admit that we have a mental health concern. And then there's this lack of trust because of uh, the way we are treated. Uh, we're, uh, you know, there is, um, uh, uh, shall we say, a malignant narcissism that takes place uh, uh, in, in the professionals that serve our community. Uh, just a com many times, a lack of cultural awareness and so not knowing the language, not understanding the mannerisms, not understanding uh, the secrets of the Black family, not understanding how we may say, this is my mother, but in fact, that's really my great grandmother, or my grandmother, or you think a person is your sister or your, your, you know, but you come to find out at age 30 or 40, that was really your mother all along. I mean, there, there are so many secrets and so many uh, you know, dynamics in our community that, that we don't bring forth out of fear and out of stigma and because we don't know where to turn to and because, you know, people uh, many times in the mental health profession attempt to assimilate us with the norm, but we're such a unique group of folk that we've got to have, you know, people who really understand the way we present ourselves, our strengths, uh, you know, how our uh, economics impact us, how our uh, educational systems impact us, how the workplace impacts us, uh, because we experience oppression 
from so many different areas. We don't have necessarily places that we can turn where we're treated like an equal or, or, or in some cases, you know, like a whole person because we've been demoralized and we've been minimized. And yes, so now ma'am. you add the pandemic to it. Now we have this isolation that's added to it. Then you have, you know, all of the brutality that's coming on. Then we have this political culture yeah. that seems to have been uh, inviting or inciting uh, a lack of sensitivity or yeah. uh, mm-hmm. a, a light way of putting it. And yeah, so, if I can ask this question uh, really quickly, because uh, our, our time is, is, is wrapping up, but let me ask you this question and I'll mute myself once again uh, to hear this answer. Uh, what type of suggestions do you have for our community, specifically for our community, uh, in an effort to protect our peace and uh, during the political things going on during COVID-19, while we have access to the digital world, social media and so forth, how, what tips can we um, put in place to, to protect our peace and mental health? Okay, well, one of the things in particular, I think is so very important to recognize you know, the different symptoms of perhaps a a mental health concern or maybe a psychotic break, Uh, recognizing, and especially as we talk to uh, caretakers or law enforcement or mental health providers or primary care physicians, et cetera, that recognizing that many times mental health concerns will bring on physical complaints as well that we will have different ailments in our bodies. And so really paying attention because, you know, people are receiving care online now or folks don't have the medical uh, health insurance that they once had before. So they're not able to go get the care that they need. And so it's so important to recognize how mental health impacts the health, physical health, how physical health impacts the, 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 the mental health. And so I think it's important or those that are seeking care to uh, create some questions. And so I put together a few questions that they can even ask uh, the person that they're seeking mental health care from, whether they are a person of color or of otherwise as a professional, or if they're talking to their uh, primary care physician, whether it is you know through public assistance, medical care, et cetera. But I think that certain questions are critically, critically important. And I jotted down a few uh, questions that uh, I think would be important for them to ask. Ask, have you treated other African Americans? Um, also, they can ask if they received any training in cultural competency or uh, African American mental health. They can ask questions like, um, how familiar you are with the cultural background, which influences uh, the way we communicate um, to understand how we communicate. Find out if they're willing to incorporate you know, their, their, their faith or their culture or their norms into their treatment, um, you know, uh, also including the church and making sure that the ministries or the uh, faith, faith, faith-based faith programs have a skilled and professional uh, healthcare workers who really are coming from not just a faith perspective, but coming from skilled training to understand how to work with these populations and making sure that families know that they can receive services online uh, as well. And also there are associations, I'd like to mention an association in particular that they can reach out to the National Alliance on Mental Health, the National Alliance on Mental Health, it's known as NAMI, and they have a program for African Americans called Sharing Hope where African-Americans get together and they're sharing their stories of hope and so forth. And also there is the National Treatment Referral uh, Program. Uh, They have a helpline. That helpline is 800-662-HELP and that's 800-662-HELP. And that is a National Treatment Referral Helpline where no matter what county you in, they can find uh, a professional male health care worker of color or who is skilled that can work with the particular population. And then Amen. there's the Black Mental Health Alliance. And this is a very important group, the Black yeah. Mental Health Alliance. And their number is 410. That's 410-338-2642. And that's 410-338-2642. 
understanding that we have concerns and we're afraid and we don't trust just because of the way we've been oppressed and the way we've been uh, 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 disrespected and abused and taken advantage of and so many different biases toward us, even in the mental health field coming from the- Yes, ma'am. Thank, so thank you, thank you. So we have a lot of our workers on the front line during this pandemic. And so they're really suffering from and experiencing a lot of mental health uh, trauma. And so yeah, certainly they are the ones that we really wanna reach out to and make phone calls to and just double checking on people because they're not coming in for care anymore. And so just, you know, reach out to your neighbor, reach out to a friend and just talk to them and listen to them. And I think that that will help in the community as well. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wanda. You That was a, a lot of information was sharing in the limited time that we have, but it's very valuable. So thank you so very much. Um, stay on the line. If you can. And of course, you can mute yourself, uh, but stay on the line. Uh, very impacting information that you shared. Um, in the in the comments, we're going to go ahead and put um, um, some of the numbers, some of the resources that, that you mentioned. Uh, we'll have that in the comments below, uh, so you can be able to. So you that are listening can be able to uh, take advantage of those resources to help keep your peace, your sanity. Uh, even in the the event page that we put for for uh, this Facebook discussion, we also have from NAMI as well a black uh, black history or black. Uh, mental health in the black community is also another hour webinar that's also there. So great resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and you also, you didn't know it, but you had a great segue uh, to talking about the faith community. So uh, as we look at the faith community, uh, that's a major, uh, major, um, I guess, resource, you know, here in, in the, in our, in the community period. And so with that, we have with us uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Fritz Williams, uh, pastor, uh, First Baptist uh, Church here in Lockhart. Uh, First Baptist has been around in Lockhart since 1877. It is uh, 143 years old here in our community. We, so we are excited for that staple in, in the community to be able to kind of release our mental health uh, uh, and, and as unto the Lord. And also we have Reverend Sean Rivers, who's, I believe, on the call as well, who's pastor of Eben Baptist Church in Luling, Texas. And Eben Baptist Church has been around in Caldwell County for 155 years, starting in 1865, another staple in our community. So we are excited to have these, uh, these men of, of God on the, the, the call to be able to discuss some things about faith, about mental health, about religion. And so, gentlemen, if you are on the call, if you are on the line, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, I will do my best to catch you and, and, and put you where I need to put you on the screen. But we are so excited to have you on the on the line to be able to answer some questions that are needed here in our community. So um, as, you, uh, as you unmute yourself, if you can begin to speak, and I'll catch you uh, so we can make sure that, that, um, that we have you online. All right. So um, one question that we're going to answer is, yes, ma'am. One question we're going to answer is, look, with everything going on, like Ms. Wanda mentioned, from COVID-19 to being to seeing some of these things played out, whether you're Black, White, Hispanic, or whatever, it's all caused trauma. It's all brought up some old stuff that either, look, that's not right. I don't like what's going on with that individual, or even people uh, hurt that look like you. My question is, um, for these these pastors is what do you say to someone who asks where is God in all of this? If God loves us so much, why is he letting black people go through this? People of color go through this. I mean, we all go through stuff, y'all. But as you see, if you look at history, I've learned so much just about black history in general, especially during COVID. People of color have gone through a lot. Black people have gone through a lot. And we see it played out on, on the news often stereotypes often we see this why is god allowing us to go through this uh and where is god let me the question is where is god in the unjust treatment of people of color so gentlemen if you are on i, I know i saw you on if you can kind of unmute yourself and you can go ahead and answer that question for us where is god in all this hey, hey, so i'm i'm here pastor sean rivers um, um, hey. I think I saw Dr. Fritz Williams. If he would like to go first, I'm fine with that. Uh, Dr. Williams, you on? Or would you like to? He who talks first goes first. 
<laughs> he pulling rank on me a little bit. Okay, no problem. Um, he said, where is, where is God and all the injustice in our community? Um, I believe that God is, is still where he's always been on his throne. Um, in Genesis 3 and 9, God asked a question to Adam, but Adam failed to sin. He says, Adam, where art thou? And God um, came off the, came off his throne, he said, and looked for Adam in the cool of the air. I believe God is looking for us to, and uh, wanting to know where we are spiritually in our community. I believe our community has, we have allowed um, a few things to um, to sit uh, sit before God. In Matthew 6 and or 3 says, uh, you know, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all things should be added unto us. Um, so if we place God back in his rightful place, the things that we're looking for, the peace, um, the strength in our community, the structure in our community, those things will take place. And I believe that every moral ethical thing on earth comes from God. And James 1 and 7 says every good thing comes from heaven. Um, so without God, there is no love. And that's the problem, I believe. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says that if we have not love, we have nothing. And the problem with us with not having love um, in 1 Peter 4 and 8, it said love covers a multitude of sin. So if we're looking for peace, you know, it's going to come with us loving ourselves and loving one another. Um, and my, and I'll, I'll be quiet and let Fritz go, allow Fritz to go forward. And, uh, I'll, I'll be back with you. Well, thank you, Pastor Rivers. Uh, I want to say good evening to everyone, and um, and I want to thank uh, Pastor Councilman Bryant for putting this together. Uh, much applause to you, sir, for having the guts and the uh, wits to uh, put something together like this so that we could all come together. It's very much needed, and I think uh, Pastor Rivers is, is correct that uh, when we ask, where is God? God is God is and has been and will always be where he is. And uh, I think from a theological perspective, we always think that God is somewhere where we are not. When God is what the old folks used to say with this theological term, omnipresent, that God is everywhere. <clears throat> and I think even uh, King David in the psalm appropriately says this, is that if I took the wings of a dove, meaning that David was in trouble, David was in turmoil, David was going through, and like Sister Hammond said, whether it was psychological, internal, or uh, whether it was spiritual, he was going through. But he, say, he did say this, whether I take the wings of a dove, and fly away, thou art there. If I even go to the cleft, thou art there. Wherever I go, God is there. Now, the question may be, why isn't God attending to my need? <laughs> and I think that's where we get into trouble is, and as Pastor, Pastor Sean did say this, that because of sin, but also because of this, that God is not always, God is involved, but also we have to understand that the process of time has already been set. That God is involved in working out, but he has already worked out if we would follow through. But because of the course of this world, we must also understand that there's some things that God, even though he is there, will not touch because he is the sovereign God. And because of the wickedness of man, some things just have to take place. Now, do I want my child to hurt? Do I want my creation to groan if it was my creation to go through anything? Of course, we all say this, heck no, we don't wanna go through nothing or we don't want anyone to incur any kind of pain or suffering, right? And that's the whole thing of evil and suffering that we deal with. But the, but the beautiful thing is, 
is that when you are in relationship to someone, like God is in relationship to us, that we have a different understanding as well as attachment that says, even though God may not physically get involved in what I'm going through right now, that our belief system understands that yes, God is there. And without a shadow of a doubt, like Big Mama said, God is going to come through for me. And if he don't come through for me, it doesn't change what I know in my heart that God is rock solid, he is stable in my life and he will work it out. And I think we have to come to that point to where we understand that we are no longer in a Big Mama Faith generation. This generation doesn't have Big Mama Faith like some of us grew up on where we saw them work out miracles with nothing or we saw them go through tragedy, turmoil, and pandemic-like situations, pushing through stuff, making ways out of no way, or in pain, going to work, going to school, or even caring the family. But their faith was rock solid, and they knew that God would work it out, or if he didn't work it out, he was going to work it out, whether that would be through death or whether that would be through continued struggle. And I think that's much of what we have to learn and continue to teach our generations to come is that struggle, the struggle is for real, but God is still with us in the struggle. Thank you, sir. Awesome, awesome. Um, I do want to say we, we have about, uh, I, I see you, uh, 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 Pastor Rivers. I want to say this and ask another question and answer it, add on. Um, we have about, I know as us as preachers, now all of us right now, we all preaching, we can all go. And so I want to remind, you know, we are, we are coming to a close in our conversation. So we have about four minutes. So I'm, let me ask you this question. And then we can all, uh, Pastor Rivers, you can answer what you're going to say. My question is, so just kind of recap. God is where he always was. He's on a throne and he still cares and loves for his children. My question is, I'll throw it to you, Pastor Rivers and Pastor uh, uh, Williams, you can close us out. My, my question is, what do you say to the black community or people in general who say, you know what, the Bible, because I've heard this said before, the Bible is a white man's book, so I'm not going to read it. You know, it's for white people, whatever, which is not true. We know it's not true, but some times people have that thought. And then they start digging and they start digging to and go uh, into Egyptology, into different things, into different faiths and don't believe in God and so forth. What do you say to people who start digging, but don't, they, they're, they cut their digging short? Right, they because we know there's black history in the Bible, we know that, but they they stop. So, what do you say to people who say, you know what, the Bible's not for me because X, Y, and Z? I'll stop talking, and mind you, we have about four minutes, so if you can keep that in mind, uh, but I appreciate your answers, Pastor Rivers. To you, sir, uh, yes, uh, I'll be brief. Um, however, um, that question does occur a lot, and I'll you know, I'll always give scripture in biblical information so someone may want to research it themselves. John 1 and 1 says in the, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And those of us who have studied, we realize the word is Jesus Christ himself. Well, the Bible declares in Mary that Mary and Joseph fled to Egypt, Matthew 2 and 13. Why would they flee somewhere that where they were going to be seen? Egypt is in Africa. Egypt is in Africa and Bethlehem uh, is about 690 kilometers from Egypt which is 428 miles. Israel is 381 miles from Africa. So all this origin that says that, hey, you know, we have some African, African culture, African, African culture within the, within the Bible. Where did we get the saying where black is beautiful? Well, the book of Solomon says, uh, the, book of, the book of Solomon, Song of Solomon says in uh, one and five, and I'll read it to you. It says, uh, here we go. I'll be brief, like I said. Song of Solomon 1 and 5 says, I am dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tent of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. So it says that we're, they were dark and they were lovely. So that's where we get the term black is beautiful. Moses' wife was Ethiopian, and Moses survived in Pharaoh's kingdom, which was in Egypt. Egypt is in Africa. So there's another origin of African culture. So to say that the book is not for us, and it talks about slavery, what we know. Well, Moses' people, the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians. So the 
you know, so slavery didn't derive from the European culture, it derived from Egypt. So then that's a whole nother study. But this to say that the Bible is not for them and it's not understanding the rich history, you know, of who Jesus is, how he was born in Bethlehem and his parents fled to Egypt. But they're not going to flee somewhere where he's going to be seen. So, and they're, and they're what we recognize. So, and that, that just kind of, you know, is an answer all in itself. Um, what I was going to say though, in Psalm, you know, Psalms 136, we talked about the last question. We just must realize that God's mercy endures forever. In Psalms 136. And that mercy means endures, that means that it holds on to us in the midst of our trouble. And then Paul said, God's grace is sufficient. Grace is symbolic of God's presence. So God's, God is always with us through his mercy and his grace. Go ahead, Go ahead Pastor. Uh, thank you, Pastor Bryant, Pastor Rivers. But let me make this statement here, and I had to make sure I write it down so that uh, I could get it right. We have to be careful how we turn uh, hate for people into hate for God's word. We got to be careful once again how we turn hate for for people into hate for God's word. We can't say we hate white people and then hate God's word. And I love how someone earlier, it might be Sister Hammond once again, who talked about oppression, systematic oppression that we have gone through. And because the white slave master or the Spaniard slave master, uh oh, we get into some really stuff right there uh, from a historical pr uh, 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 perspective is that especially the European slave master put us through so much that we saw what they were teaching us as contradictory, right? It was complicit. It wasn't what it should have been. It was not matching up and lining up until we were able to read for ourselves. And I wanna challenge people that <clears throat> you have to read the word of God for yourself because as, as it says in Hebrew writing, it is the same yesterday and forevermore, God is, but also his word is living. So his, if his word is living, it was living way before we started uh, reading it because it's in God, it is who he is. Jesus is the word made flesh. So let me say this. The Bible origins go back way before even the Bible was written. <clears throat> Of course, we know that, but we have to understand that it came straight out of the motherland itself, out of Africa. Even before Jesus was born, there was the word of God already in place in the first creation in the garden. So if Adam typically is the symbol of the first man, listen, we, we normally say that and his, historians are digging it up every day that listen, the first origins come out of Africa, the Garden of Eden, somewhere there uh, 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 along the Nile River, somewhere up in Egypt, somewhere over in Ethiopia, somewhere up in those channels. So won't get into those details, but we have to understand though, is that the word of God was living there. Now, throughout time, throughout journeys, uh, uh, especially taking the Fertile Crescent route, getting into a whole bunch of other stuff that I didn't want to tip into, uh, that was sharing of information from place to place. So we have to understand that, that God's word has been passing and going, even in ancient Babylon and even in Persia, there have been, there have been findings of not only the law of code or Hammurabi, but even as the development of the, what we call the 10 commandments, some of those share similarities. So what are we saying? That, that God's word has been living for a long time. But we must not develop a hate for people, change it to a hate for people because of what they heaved upon us. But we have to come and learn of it ourselves. Now, I know this these generations and even some of us are getting into different religious experiences, but we have to be careful because then you leave something that you call the white man's when it's not the white man's. Actually, it's God's, God has given us, given it to all men. 
and we have and listen we have to still understand that god is greater than people his word is greater than people whether they're white black brown or whatever color or nationality or ethnicity and i know i have to cut it short because i keep i'll keep going but yes, listen yes. his word his word and the existence of god and his presence goes way back now because of changes within civilization and we thank the Romans, right? We have this love hate relationships with the Romans, but we thank God even for the Romans road, which was a dangerous road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, 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 because, and because of Constantine, even though Constantine used Christianity to support his efforts, but yeah. still because of those avenues, we were exposed more and the, and the Christian movement was able to spread more and we gained further understanding of who God is. Now, American Christianity, we get into all of that. That's a whole yeah. different subject and maybe yeah. we'll talk about it one Wednesday night. <laughs> wow, I appreciate you guys. You, that was phenomenal. Thank you, thank you. I didn't want to cut it short, but I had to. Uh, I appreciate you all. I just was taking notes. It was it was good to me. I felt like I was in church, and everything. I was excited. So thank you, pastors, Pastor River, Pastor Sean Rivers of Eben, Eben Baptist Church, uh, Reverend Doctor uh, Fritz Williams from First Lockhart, I mean from from First Baptist Church here in Lockhart. Thank you for that. So my takeaway from this conversation, because we had church, y'all are both preaching. My takeaway is God uh, is still on the throne. The, that the Bible is not a white man's book, it's for everybody. That God, there's, there's proof, as Pastor Rivers mentioned, and we talked about how, I'm not going to preach, I'm just going to stop there. There's proof. So thank you what Pastor River, pa Pastor William said, we can't hate white people and love God's word at the same time, right? Even though we had a situation that happened to us from European descent, from slave owners being white, you know, right? But we can't take that and hate all white people. That doesn't work that way. That's not what the word of God talks about. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Awesome job. Now, as we get ready to move on, let me recap really quick, quickly. We're halfway done. I know we we got about, 30, I know it's a long conversation, but it's needed. We have about 30 uh, minutes left, okay, uh, as we get ready to move on to this next young lady who's going to be sharing uh, something very important. Um, just want to remind you, we still have a few more topics left. Let me go back here really quickly. Uh, if you can see my screen. This is where we're at. So I wanna make sure we're all on the same page so that, that way you know where we're going. We, we're on number five. We're talking about uh, education. Then we're gonna to go to early ECI, early childhood intervention. Followed by that, we're talking with uh, Miss Jackie Campbell. And then we're gonna close up with Dr. The almost soon to be Dr. Sabri Zuper, amen. And then we'll have a, uh, all, of our, all of our questions we'll have a chance to answer. I know it's lengthy. I, we're only sharing about 10 minutes as the best that we can, but we wanted to make sure that we brought you this much needed conversation. Uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Fritz Williams, thank you for the comments, sir. Thank you for acknowledging the work that's being done. And we thank all the panelists and thank you, the viewer that has been on. Now with that said, let's get to the next topic, which is education and the black community. We have a 2016 Lockhart High School graduate, Ms. Shanice Manning, is on with us. Uh, I've, I've known this family for quite a long time, knew Ms. Sh uh, Shanice when she was younger. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Physics from Louisiana State University. She is now the University Admissions Counselor. She has a lot of history, a lot of wisdom that she's learned that she has to share. And let's get ready to introduce Ms. Shanice Manning to the panel. As you know, Ms. Shanice, uh, you have about 10 minutes to share about Black uh, education in the Black community, even from your perspective. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome Shanice Manning. Hey guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm gonna go ahead and start my timer because I've been trying to keep time for everybody. Um, so if y'all hear anything, that's me setting a timer for myself, but I'm extremely excited to be here. Um, so as mentioned before, Shanice Manning, I graduated from Lockhart High School in 2016, and I guess that's where I'm gonna go ahead and get started um, as far as where my educational journey went. I am a proud, proud, proud member of First Baptist Church with um, Pastor Fritz Williams. Um, I have known Mr. and Mrs. Williams literally my entire life growing up in this community. Um, everybody, a lot of these people on this call have literally seen me, watched me grow up 
And it's super crazy to kind of see me here about to turn 23 next month, which I think for everybody on this call, you can kind of be like, what is going on? But yes, um, we, we finally hit this post. So I'm extremely blessed and honored that I got the opportunity to receive my bachelor's of science, but even more so, I'm blessed and honored that I've gotten the opportunity to infiltrate this system and actually to see what it is like for higher education um, for a higher education institution, what exactly they're looking for for our students, and why Lockhart may or why Caldwell County may be sitting in the back burner of that. Um, I don't want to hurt any feelings on this call. However, I'm a very honest person, so I'm going to give it to you exactly how it is. And I'm going to tell you exactly why these top tier schools or a lot of these schools don't really give Lockhart the time of day. Um, 2016, let me just say that I was that student, and I do not mean that in any type of rude or conceited way. However, I was that student academically, I was that student within track, and I was that student extracurricularly. It was hard for a lot of people to believe that during my process, during my college admissions process, a lot of these things by my, a lot of kind of development, trying to find things. my mom and my dad, I'm carrying it at Manny, which are on call. They are so supportive in everything um, that I've ever done. And, you know, between the three of us, including my sister, so the four of us, you know, we all tried to figure out this whole weird thing that is the college admissions process. And sadly, the thing that the first thing that I can say that is lacking from our system is guidance. The reason why it is lacking in this way is because we're not really on the radar. And let me exactly let me tell you what schools are looking for. Coming to an um, an upper um, an up, a higher education institution, working inside, reading applications every day. Essentially, my territory is Lockhart. It's the Central Texas area. However, when I got hired, I told LSU to hire me on the stipulation that I would come to Lockhart High School, no questions asked. And the reason why is because. A lot of the things that I learned in training, I realized that we're missing a whole demographic of students and of individuals that have so much passion, so much knowledge, and it's just because the school or because the community is complacent. And that is what I kind of want to touch on, complacency. The African-American community, community within Caldwell County is very complacent in where they are, and that's completely okay. When Lockhart and when a system has been working time and time again, you a lot of the times don't think that you need change. However, this world is progressing. This world is changing whether you like it or not. When you leave laws that are Lockhart, you will see a world far beyond your world far beyond your own. And that is something extremely important. So essentially what these larger institutions are looking for and why they, we aren't on the radar is the first things first, socioeconomics. Yes, of course, it is not it is not, um, I guess, unknown that maybe Lockhart does not have the funds um, that are coming in that we would like. However, that is actually not what's setting us back. That's only one factor. We actually rank pretty low to standardized testing. Um, a lot of that, and I will kind of kind of share what I think that what we can do and fix that. We rank extremely low within standardized testing, but even more so, we rank low in GPA and course rigor of our students. We actually go by this entire kind of um, view. It's called College Board, and College Board is actually going to generate from every school and every high school kind of just a demographic or just different information that I as an admissions counselor use before I go to high schools. Of course, if you're probably thinking about my top tier high schools in my territory, of course, you're right. We're looking at the hills of Austin. We're looking at Alamo Heights. We're looking at Westlake. We're looking at Lake Charles, where I am able to take my services to these schools, I give them presentations, and I am actively recruiting, talking, pulling, wanting these students to come to LSU. Now, you're probably wondering, why is the same effort coming to LSU? And the, the reason why is because for a lot of these schools, they return on investment. And they don't see a return on investment is because they don't see Lockhart doing anything progressive for test scores, doing anything progressive for classes that students are taking, doing anything progressive as far as those students and those names out there and that is where we start. I also want to kind of tell you guys um, as we were going on I kind of mentioned my college admissions process at the end at the beginning but let me also kind of preference this I'm very open. I, like I said before I was a great student or so I thought I received no or little to no shout out to the black community for backing me up. I received little to no scholarships to fund my higher education degree. Um, a lot of hurt a lot of the scholarships that I saw that were going out that I did not receive, but but even more so, it was just the fact of where the scholarships were being distributed, if you know what I mean. And that's the next thing is that we are overlooking these students that could have this top potential. 
Um, I always like to make the joke that the reason why I was so well taken care of at Lockhart ISD is because of Yvette Manning, because nobody will mess with Miss Yvette Manning. However, that should not be an excuse and that should have not been the only reason why I was placed in these AP classes, placed in these honors classes and given this immense responsibility, not just because of who my parents, my grandparents, my uncles, and my cousins were, not because of my name. I time and time again saw my cousins, saw my family members in different positions than myself. And it is extremely, um, it was extremely hard hard because I never got the opportunity to really engulf myself in my community. Um, I actually mentioned to Mr. Brian on the phone, I said, you know, the biggest reality that hit me when I went to Louisiana State University was that I was a black woman. And that was crazy to kind of think about the fact that Lockhart didn't exactly teach me what my skin color meant. Lockhart didn't teach me how powerful my skin color was. In fact, it was a, it was a white physicist his name was Dr. Brown, and I will never forget this. I, I sat in my first um, physics lab class and I cried, you guys. Um, the thing about classes, the thing about these classes is that you're very independent. And so it is the fact that I had no idea how to write a lab book. I was always so used to having, you know, you need your title, purpose, you know, the teachers gave you everything that you needed. But in this class, it was all about how to think like a physicist, how to think like a scientist. And I wasn't there yet. I self-taught myself physics. I self-taught myself the things that I wanted to do in life, that when I got to that position and I saw all of these other kids that were also top of their class. So please, for a moment, let's kind of step back. Just because you're top of your class does not mean that you were going to be set up for a successful future. I read applications from valedictorians every single single day. That does not do anything for me when I read an application. It is more than that. I sat in a class of nothing but valedictorians, nothing but stamp scholars, nothing but students who got full rides. And I was very far behind. But because of the drive, the determination that my parents and my family have instilled in me, that is how I got this far. But going back to Dr. Brown, you know, I was crying. I didn't know how well I was going to do in this lab class. I told him I'm gonna drop physics. I can't do this. There's no way I can do this. He looked at me and he said, you don't understand how powerful you are sitting in this class right now. I will not allow you to fail and I will not allow you to stop and you will graduate. And then from there, he announced me as a graduate J just this past May, 2020. And he said, Shanice, didn't I tell you that? That was my first semester of physics ever. And that has always just kind of resonated and staying still with me. But yes, as I'm kind of looking in the chat, representation is everything. Let me tell you about a woman that has really kind of reached my heart. Her name is Katherine Johnson, y'all. I knew her before she was a hidden figure. I gave campus tours on LSU's campus. I've been doing so as a freshman. And um, every single time I would say what my major was, everybody would look at me and they would say, Shanice, um, does that mean you want to be a hidden figure? And I would look them back in the eye and I would say, sweetheart or ma'am, mister, we're in 2020, we're in 2019, we're in 20, if I am a hidden figure now, there is something wrong. Katherine Johnson allowed for her identity to be in this way so that I would never have to go through that. And even more so, you guys, I allowed to not receive the scholarships that I should have gotten from Lockhart. I allowed to not have the support that I had. I worked in order to come back here and say that I will not let Lockhart to continue to go on this complacency. I will not allow this school district to allow and to just kind of step back and say, we're fine. Everything is fine when that is absolutely not the case. You are, and this is, again, not me trying to be rude, you are not on the radar for any higher education in this nation and that is a problem we have students we have amazing individuals who come through this community who deserve more than what they were given i have classmates going to medical school going to law school amazing amazing individuals in this caldwell county community but they were not given the support from this school district to allow to push them forward. So what can we do for our students? There's a lot of things. Number one is I love the fact that we talked about mental health. Let's stop making it so taboo. Let's teach our students, let's teach all of our individuals that you have a brain. And you know, just like we try to tell everybody as far as trying to cut down racism that everybody bleeds the same color. Well, everybody thinks the same way too. You are not at all exempt from mental health, depression, anxiety, whatever is coming your way. So there is no need to try to be perfect in this way. Do know that you can make mistakes. Do also know that there is a million ways to success. And this is where I got to brag on my mom and my dad. No college degree necessary. They built a company by the hands that they had. And that is what's so important is the fact that there is no set, there's no kind of like way or no exact way that you can go as far as success goes. And that's my timer, you guys. I will, I will stop here in a second. Um, but the biggest thing
is, you know, success. We can talk about trade school, community college, um, any of those different avenues that we may have, even more so. Let's also talk about the fact of the ACT and the SAT. A lot of the times within Texas, as though our school district kind of points out the SAT, you guys, these out of state students, do not take the SAT and if they do, they do have the option of taking the ACT as well because we see that students kind of vary as far as how they do in both. So it's opening up the horizons. Is this going to take work? Yes, but can our counselors get in there? Can our elected officials, can our education officials get in there, write grant money, write letters, ask for, ask for individuals to come and seek guidance? Yes, and that is what we're missing. We are missing initiative. I have given my initiative. So now as parents, now as the community leaders, if you guys wanna come at me with all the questions, comments, concerns that you may have, and I'm gonna go through the chat right now and answer them for you, then absolutely keep doing that. And I'll put my contact information at the end. But the biggest thing that we have to understand is that complacency is what is keeping us right here. And it is time to look Lockhart in the mirror and say, we are not doing enough. What can we do more to support our students? I'm going to go ahead and start with the questions that we have. So for scholarships passed over our black and brown students and or the counselor ignored. Yes, that, that is actually, absolutely. Um, it was kind of passed over. I do not believe that my scholarship application was given out to everybody, um, all the companies. So the one thing that I will say on advice to anybody who um, is that does give out scholarships to our students, please, please, please be very active during that time. Ask for every single application and you ask to go through every single application because there is a selective um, type of tendencies that I did see. And you know, again, this is not me trying to bash. I really do give everything to my community as far as the woman that I am today. This is me acknowledging and me saying, okay, because I love you guys so much, it's time to fix it. I'm kind of being a parent here. Love you, but let's fix it. Let's tweak. So yes, so I do absolutely think that um, there are some things that were looked over. So as somebody who gives out scholarship money, your, your money means something, especially to these students. Please, please, please ask for all of them um, in their entirety. Next yes. is how can we Oh no, I'm gonna ask you one more question. Because girl, you're on fire. I don't I don't want to stop you. I'm I'm taking notes. I'm like, man, I have to listen to this. I'm glad it's recorded. I'm glad it's recorded. I'm glad it's recorded because um I have to uh because we're gonna go back and listen to this. We have two more people. I'm gonna let you answer this next one. You're on fire, you're on fire. So keep going. One more question, and then we want to move on to the next one. But we're coming back because this is needed. So I'm being quiet. You're doing great. All right, so these next couple of questions, how can we encourage our students and families to raise their hand and to help? So the biggest thing you guys, or to get to get help. Um, so the biggest thing you guys is go to these school board meetings. They are open to the public. Go to your elected officials, let them know what you want. Um, and then even more so, Type of utilize your, your students, especially during this time, they're getting a lot of different emails. I know that my university in particular is sending out many, many emails. I need you guys to be transparent also with your students and try to see what they need. A lot of what's going on in 2020 and a lot of what I'm finding with our students is that they're scared. They have no idea what's going on in front of them. On top of that, they're trying to get through this college admissions process and honestly, I I don't even know what advice I could give them to because we're all living through it during the same time. So allow them to be transparent. And then from there, we need to push through and we need to push um, a lot of the a lot of our discussions to the school board. You know, uh, Mr. Estrada, he is really open. I've had many conversations with him and he is super open, honest and concerned and ready to kind of tackle these things head on. So I think the biggest thing is, you know, the moment that we can acknowledge and the moment that we can openly say, you know, the problems that are happening is the moment that we can change those things. And I do want you guys to to know that I am working diligently with the school board. So any type of ideas that or concerns that you may have, I am willing to absorb those and take those with me because I'm an advocate and I am a fighter for our students. And then what are some ideas um, do I have that are that can be necessary changes? The biggest thing you guys is just, I guess you could say um, accessibility accessibility for all students. This is not like Baton Rouge. These students in Baton Rouge that I work with have nothing. If they do not go to a, pub, a private school paying college tuition, they do not have anything. We're blessed. And I need everybody to kind of kind of soak that in. We talk about Lockhart, we talk about Caldwell County, we talk about all of these different things, but we are blessed compared to some of the things that I see outside of my window. 
So the biggest thing is to, you know, open up the conversation again with our officials, but then even, even, even more so kind of some of the necessary changes is to kind of go out for some of that grant money that is open and that is open for our students, especially the grant money um, for the underrepresented communities that we have. Even more so, we need to look at maybe even bringing outside sources to talking to our students. I actually did a one-on-one um, -on -one FaceTime call. I opened up my line for all Lockhart ISD students. Sadly, I only got like three students, but they were all middle school students. The crazy thing from all of these middle school students is they said Shanish or Miss Manning. Um, they, they tried to call me my mom and I was like, no, not the same thing. But Miss Manning, um, you know, you were the only person that told me that my potential is endless. That is the change. These are children, guys. These are kids. These are minority kids. I'm sorry if I get emotional, but these are minority kids that have never heard that their potential is endless. And that has got to stop. That is the only way that we can propel our students forward is if we can first tell them that no matter where you're from, no matter what your background is, you have a future. Where you want to go in this future, how about we lay out all the options in front of you and we give you an opportunity to explore each and every one. I feel like that is the change and that is something that's really going to open up our students' minds and to allow them to know that they are worth it and they're worth every option that this world has because you'd be surprised. But I won't keep talking. Again, you guys, if y'all have any questions at all, drop them in the chat. I'm also on the Facebook as well, kind of doing it adjacently. So ask any questions and I'll also drop all of my contact information at the end. Thank you. Wow. Wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So very proud of you. Our community is proud of you. Um, got me fired up. You're, you're doing amazing. And um, one thing you, you highlighted, you said so much. And by the way, this is being recorded. Um, we're recording this right now. It's also on Facebook. You can go back and watch the replay. I would suggest you do that, especially with that conversation we just had right there. She dropped so many nuggets, so many important things that we as community need to implement in our children from elected officials, from school board, from parents. I mean, this was great. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We will have more time at the back end of the conversation to answer and ask more questions to all of our panelists in an open dialogue and discussion. Uh, but Shanice, we're proud of you. We, I mean, you, I know you hear it, but you're doing an amazing job. And thank you for fighting. Thank you for speaking truth. Thank you for uh, accepting the invitation as a young person to come back and encourage our young people. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, wow. And so with the same thing with Lockhart ISD, we have Luling ISD, we have Prairie Lee ISD, all within Caldwell County. And I think this is things that what she mentioned is very important for our, our people of color and black students in general. So thank you once again. With, with that being said, I want to now transition to our next panelist, which coincides with what, what Shanice just mentioned. Our next panelist is Tanika Martin. Let me share her information very briefly. And by the way, family, uh, most of the bios for all of our speakers are is in our event page. So in case you want to know more, it's in our event page. And many of the speakers will leave their information at some point in the, in the chat as well. I want to introduce you to Ms. Tanaya Martin. Uh, she's going to be speaking on early childhood intervention. She's the outreach coordinator, coordinator for Blue Bonnet Trails here in Caldwell County for the ECI program. She has 16 years of experience, and she is uh, going to share a little bit. She's going to share her screen, so let me stop sharing mine. Uh, but she's going to speak to, what about our children? Now we know uh, Shanice spoke to about our high schoolers, about our middle schoolers, even our elementary students, making sure they know that their potential is in this. What if you have somebody like me, somebody who might have some delay? Like when I was growing up, I had a speech impediment. I was in, uh, I had to ride the little short yellow bus because I had a delay that people could not understand me. What happens? Do those children get labeled like I did? And are they not smart? Or what happens when you hear your child say, you know, you're, as a parent, your child may have a, de a delay? What do you do with that information? So uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Martin is going to share a lot more than what I can share, but I wanted to give a segue to we're still talking about education. Now let's look to our zero to three-year-olds. So with that said, ladies and gentlemen, get ready to receive Ms. Tanaya Martin to share uh, about ECI, Early Childhood Intervention. Hello, I am super excited to be a part of this discussion. Woo. Shanice, you really did it, girl. I, you know, love it, love it, love it. So I am super excited. Um, 
you know, to hear all about what you're doing in, in Lockhart. It's, it's very uh, much needed. Um, but yes, I'm excited to be a part of this discussion um, with some of the citizens and leaders in Caldwell County. I'm pretty much new kind of to the Caldwell County area. Um, I've been working more in the Williamson County, but um, I'm excited to be connect, you know, making connections and share information about ECI with, you know, those who may not be, uh, may be um, not as familiar with ECI. Um, there's such a disparity in ECI statewide with the enrollment of our um, black and brown babies, birth to three. Um, so I'll, you know, so I'm here to kind of educate um, you guys, the parents, the, the guardians, the caregivers of infants and toddlers, um, and tell you about, about, a little bit about our program and the services that we offer. So um, one of our mottos at ECI is early is best. So, you know, we want to identify and pro provide assistance for those babies that may need our help so that, so that they can be more successful when they start elementary. So let me um, kind of share my screen and I'll be really quick. Uh, and give me a minute to share in my little slideshow here. So um, I'm a part of Blue Bonnet Trails Community Services Early Intervention Program. So I am um, their child, child find, um, outreach coordinator. Also, I'm a service coordinator and I'm an early intervention specialist. And I'll talk a little bit about what um, the early intervention specialist does. Um, so what is early childhood intervention? Um, so Blue Bond is one of the many uh, programs across Texas that is a part of this, uh, the statewide um, early intervention service network. So there's an ECI program all over the state of Texas. And so Blue Bonnet is just one of those programs um, that service the birth to three community. We are under the umbrella of the Health and Human Services Commission, the H -H HSSC, um, that is responsible in coordinating um, all the early intervention programs in the state of Texas. So no matter where you live, there's that early intervention, uh, early childhood intervention program that can serve you. Um, Blue Bonnet contracts with Caldwell County, of course, uh, ba uh, Bastrop, um, Burnett County, and of course, Williams County. And then we service a little bit of Bell and Gonzales counties as well. So what does ECI do? So um, as, as uh, Mr. Bryant said, that we work with children birth to three that have developmental delays or disabilities. Um, we provide services in um, that child's natural environment. And research shows that uh, infants and toddlers, they learn best through everyday experience and interaction with familiar people in their familial context. That means at home or at daycare, wherever they're, they are throughout the, throughout the day, um, we team up with those caregivers and we coach them and give them strategies um, to teach um, strategies to teach their kids. Um, we offer, ECI offers a variety of services. We offer um, special skills training, which is done by um, what I just said, an early intervention specialist. So an early intervention specialist is basically that developmental teacher. So she's able to work on all areas of development. Um, and it, you know, I explained it kind of like when you were in elementary and you had one teacher that taught all subjects. So basically that's what an early intervention specialist does. They are, they know a little bit about communication, about motor skills, about, um, you know, um, you know, fine motor, gross motor skills, behavior, um, self-help skills. So they can pretty much do a little bit of everything and help assist the, the family. So we also have speech therapy, occupational therapy. We have um, physical therapy. We have counseling. We have a counselor. We have a nutritionist on staff. And as well, um, we also have an auditory and visual impairment services that we provide as well. And those services are provided by a AIVI service 
um, that is uh, provided by a certified teacher that works with deaf or, or blind education for deaf and blind education. Uh, each family, when they are enrolled, they are uh, also given a service coordinator to help them monitor the services, help them make sure the kids are making progress, um, and kind of to connect them with resources they may not already have. Um, so that's a really great service as well. Um, like if um, a parent is just need a specialist, you know, uh, may need uh, help connecting with a specialist if their kid is uh, on the autism spectrum. We, you know, make sure that we connect the family with those resources. Um, who can make a referral? Basically, um, any parent, guardian, or medical professional can make a referral to ECI. And, you know, um, and make a referral is bit pretty much on your professional judgment or, you know, a family's concern. Like if you have a gut feeling that something is not you know, quite right with your child, please make a referral. I mean, because if you suspect a delay, you know, we will do our evaluation on your child, uh, for your child, um, again, birth to three at no cost. Um, we encourage families not to do, you know, not to just take a wait and see approach on their child's development. It's better to be, to go ahead and just have the evaluation just to see where they are than, you know, just waiting, you know, because sometimes what happens is we wait and we wait until the child is in elementary and then behavior, you know, problems may start because um, they're, they have a delay or they're lacking that, you know, this, you know, uh, missed out on the support they could have gotten. Um, so please don't wait. Um, evaluation for us is free. Um, and you can make a referral by, you can go on the Early Childhood Intervention website um, on the Texas Health and Human Services site. Um, all you have to do is put your zip code in or the county you live in or the city you live in and they will, it will pull up the ECI program that's closer to you. So you put it in Caldwell County, it'll actually pull up Blue Bonnet. Um, so that's the services or, you know, um, or anywhere in college, you know, Luland, Giddings, you put that in, uh, we, we serve that area. And then also there's, you know, there's that uh, 877 number you can call, or again, you can go online and just um, figure out which um, um, ECI service would best um, serve you and that, that which local ECI service um, is in your area. So the cost of our services actually the, um, it, the cost of our service, they, don't, they won't start until you um, actually start services. But however, we accept Medicaid, CHIP, um, any private, other private um, insurance, um, TRICARE, or, and if a parent doesn't have insurance, then what happens is that um, it bumps into what we call a family cost share. So we look at the income, we take, um, uh, in consideration, all their deductions they have, like medical expenses, even childcare expenses, we take that in consideration as well, and um, and then we come up with the monthly um, monthly charge for our services. Um, and our services, uh, it's a monthly charge, and it's our for our services, not per service. It's um, so whatever services that you receive for your ch child is just that one monthly fee. Um, and then here I just put um, just one of our flyers that have our number um, where, you know, you can call that um, we have a 24 hour like crisis hotline. We also have the 1844 number that you can call to make a referral. Um, it tells you a little bit uh, more about ECI um, and then also all the services that we offer as well. Um, and here's my number right here. Um, if anybody have any questions, they want to call. But please, please, if you know, please, please, if you guys have any questions about um, a kiddo birth to three, please call. Don't wait. 
you know, because what's happening is our kiddos are entering elementary and having behavior problems. And then, and then that's where they're getting labeled and they really shouldn't be because, you know, and a lot of times, um, you know, I'm a, I have to say this too, a lot of times the people in our community, you know, the black and brown community, they don't want to refer their kids because they think they're going to be labeled. But what happens is they're not going to be labeled at an early age. You know, if we can get them into services and get, you know, um, whatever is going on with them, um, them assistance for that, then it alleviate, you know, any problems that they will have in the future. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Ms. Martin, for sharing. Um, that's very valuable information. I want to highlight once again, um, don't wait. You know, if you have any questions, uh, don't wait. Make sure that you ask and if any possible delays, call, you know, because we want to make sure that we're getting the necessary services for our kids. And one of the barriers that comes up as we get ready to transition to another subject, one of the barriers is, especially in the Black community, you know, you already talked about the stigma of the taboo, right? But at the same mm -hmm. time, I don't want to, I don't want to do it, right? Because uh, God's going to heal my child. Or I, don't, I think just because you're receiving services does not mean your faith in God does not exist. So we have absolutely. to understand that. Have you seen that before? Is, is that one of the barriers you've come across? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, a lot of times there, you know, a lot of times that's one of the barriers saying, you know what, God's going to fix them. Yeah. But God also give us wisdom as well. You know what I'm saying? And put people in your pathway to assist you, you know? So that's, that's definitely one of the barriers that, um, that I've seen, you yes. know? Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you for being in our community. Please, ladies and gentlemen, reach out to her as you as you need to. If you know somebody, if you, you know, in this call is recorded, you can take her information down. You can go back to the uh, to her information you know, in the chat. Make sure you save it. Make sure you go back and listen to it again because this is important for our, our, our children of color, for all of our children, but especially our children of color who sometimes do not receive the services that they need and they receive the labels that are unnecessary once. Mm -hmm. This whole system. And I wanted to say again, I want to reiterate, getting an evaluation with ECI is free. Service, it doesn't, you know, um, sometimes, you know, they're like, I don't want to, you know, you know, finances may be a barrier, but you know, finances may be a barrier, but um, just, you know, evaluation is free, just so you see where your child, you know, where your child is. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. We're going to get ready to, to move on to our next panelist. Ladies and gentlemen, we're almost at the end. My goal, our goal was to try to make sure we have two hours. However, um, we don't want to rush. We have another two panelists, so another 20 minutes. At the end, we're going to ask as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, we have our person who's been keeping track of all the questions. And so we kind of ask some questions to, uh, let's say, maybe the Williams or uh, our mental health questions, just so that way we uh, make sure we get them because they, they hung on the call. And then also those high priority questions as well, such as education and so forth, we'll make sure we get those answered. Shanice has been good, doing a good job already kind of answering in the chat on Facebook as well. We want to make sure that you know where we're at. So two more panelists, and then we'll open up for a wide discussion from you all as a community. So with that said, let's go ahead and transition to our next uh, panelist, our next professional. Uh, we'll get ready to hear from uh, Ms. Jackie Campbell, who is a new city of, of Luling resident. She's also a community leader, has been leading the community for many years. I've known Ms. Ms. Jackie uh, for, uh, I think for almost at least 15, maybe 20 years. And so she's a great, great woman, uh, always has a lot of wisdom, has a heart for children, heart for the community, heart for seeing people succeed. And so with that said, I want to get ready to invite Miss Jackie Campbell to the screen, to the call. And we have a few questions to ask. And we're going to hear uh, from her from a community leader, also government official. She serves on the Lewin City Council as well. So we're going to get ready to hear Welcome to the uh, call, Ms. Jackie Councilperson, Jackie Campbell. Thank you. Thank you for having me, David. Am I there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You. You're very welcome. You for, yes. This has been very interesting and very informative. Thank you. You know, yeah. I was going to tell her, please remember Lulin when you were doing Lockhart. Remember Lulin? <laughs> you know, 
Uh, <laughs> in discussing some of the things that we've talked about as far as council goes and, and barriers to the African-Americans in government, what, I mean, I've been on council for 20 years and what I have seen as, as, as barriers, and, and I have to say this, I have a very difficult time getting anything accomplished. You know, I, I, I'm not ready to bring up the systemic racism thing, but you know, I am in Ward 1 Now we can accomplish a lot of things in other wars, but it seems like we're always trailing. You know, I mean, we can have money allocated for each park, but it seems like before it gets to the Northside Park, which where I am, we will go to another park and then we're coming to Northside Park, but then we have to go back and do something else to another park before we even get there. So that's, that's really been an issue, you know, a big, big issue, even with me trying to accomplish stuff. And what I find rather than some of the community people coming to the council meetings, you generally don't have that unless there is a fight. And I just have to say it. And then when they come, everybody's mad and everybody's fussing as opposed to coming in an orderly organized way. And something that I see in, in the black community or, or uh, I see a lot of apathy. Somebody else calls it oppression. And I see a lot of fear where people just will not go up and stand up for themselves. They would rather have an organization go, you know, you get a lot of threats about NAACP, you know, you get a lot of, there's just all kinds of threats. And, and, oh, I can talk about so many rounded things. I'm trying to stay with where I need to stay and deal with the right concerns on this, on this um, Zoom, but Luling is just behind the time. I've always said that Lockhart is, has a whole lot more progressive people than Luling does, and you do. A lot of the people in Luling have either passed away who did things, or you have a lot of the kids that have left and don't come back. And then you have ones that stay there and they get hooked into the welfare system, the ladies. The guys, a lot of times they get, they do, they go to court, okay? So by going to court, they are hooked into misdemeanors, felonies, they can't get jobs, you know? And one of the things that I have taken issue with in Luling, because I came back to Luling about 20, about 25 years ago from Houston. And you talk about a cultural shock just to see things were still the same as they were when I grew up, you know? And what I found even then, the banks don't have any people of color. Now we do have one bank that is a Hispanic bank or a Mexican bank, okay? Now they have basically Hispanics and whites, but until we can have any store other than H-E-B, other than H-E-B, we have a great presence at H-E-B, but none of the local stores hire black people. And not just people, you just don't even see them hiring uh, Mexican-Americans, other people of color, you know? And this is one place where we can start is if we can get local businesses but what's happening in Luling also is so many of our local businesses are closing and you wonder why, you know, and, and you would say things start at the top and trickle down. Uh, and let me go back and say this about council. I am the only minority on council, no Hispanics, no Asians, only person of color. And sometimes it makes it very difficult getting things done, getting things passed, because it, it always appears that whatever goes on that's happening, it happens on the south side opposed to the north side. So I have had, I mean, I told somebody, I have to stand on the table to get things to happen in Luli, you know, but it's, it is what it is, and, you know, and you can pray and we can pray and we can pray, but until, you know, it's an action word. Once we pray, we get up and do something, but we have to have enough people to get up and do something. Yeah. We have to have enough people to get up and say, 
we're going to form this organization and we're going to raise money ourselves. It's not as if we're going to go to council and tell them to give us some money. You know, they're tired of that, you know, and then they just look like they roll their eyes and, you know, it, it, it's, it's just a lot of apathy here in Luling. I have to say that there really is. And when we talk about systemic racism here in, in, in Luling, it's here. You know, and I tell some of my friends, when I, even during the election, and, it, you know, it's like, you know, systemic racism, people are really going to have to die. Parents have to die. Have hate to say it like that, but people have to die because they teach their children, you know, and, and even in, in looking at the definition for systemic racism, you know, it's an, an, an embedding of what they feel is normal practices whether it's the KKK or any other organization or, or what parents do to their children. You know, growing up in my home as a young, as a child, we just didn't talk about racism. You know, and like, like Shirley Williams said, we just had fun, <laughs> you know? We did what kids did and we thought we were well off and that was just the way it was. You know, but when we integrated in the 60s, it's like, oh, wow. You know, then you really felt the brunt of racism. And, you know, now, you know, with all the things that have actually gone on during this election, you know, you used to kind of see racism a little blatant. But now racism has just gotten to be where, you know, you can go down an aisle. A lady told me she was going down an aisle, uh, this Hispanic lady, and the people were standing in the aisle and they wouldn't even move, you know, and you're getting to where it's just open, you know? So, I mean, we can pray and pray, but until we get up and do something, you know, and I'm not inciting violence or, or riots, yeah. but you know, yeah. you think about how the Black Panthers organized and they organized to, to try to do something. Let you know, me let me ask you, okay. so, uh, sorry to interrupt, but so with the question of, of doing something, uh, it brings it back to something Shanice said earlier that uh, sometimes in the black community or people of color become complacent. And so exactly. that, I lived in Lulee for five, in, for, for a while, you know, and, and so knowing that, that, that feeling. So my question to you is, and I kind of have an answer because I also wear a hat of an elected official as well, but how can we as individuals become more involved in our local government and our politics. What can we do to incite that need to not just, oh, let, let this organization do it. No, let's raise up and take some action. Not, you know, no, no violence, of course, but be about going to the meetings, speaking up at not just when there was like a, a, a zoning change or not just when we, when we want something. No, being at public comments and speaking, not just voting, but running for an office, not just running. Right. It's Jackie, by the way, Thank you so much, uh, Councilwoman, for holding down the fort, for being there, uh, for, to, for being a representative. Thank you. Th I know it's been hard. but and So thank you, thank you, thank you for continuing to stay on council. My question to you is, how can we motivate people of color to not just talk about it, but then be out there and join together and get involved in our local government or get involved, period? What, are you, what ideas do you have in the last three or four minutes that we have together? Now, what I have tried to do is say maybe like within the city, if we have a, a vacancy on our planning and zoning board, a board of adjustments, our EDC, I will normally try to make a recommendation for somebody of color. But what comes up now, nobody wants to do it. It's just amazing. But that is one thing you can ask people if you have any type of a vacancy on any of your boards or advisory committees, invite somebody to be on it and tell that person who's the chairman, hey, we need some people of color. You know, will you put somebody on now? I, I did finally get, well, this guy's been on for like 20 years and I'm really thankful, uh, somebody on the board of adjustments and I am really grateful to him. And then two, you really have to choose the people that you're willing to suggest. That's a whole nother story because you want somebody that's going to represent you in a positive way. And that's something that I've loved about you so much, David, you've always represented it well. And that's what we have to do. 
Thanks. We need to be able to do that. And we need more people to be able to do that. And we need to encourage these young boys. I mean, we really need to encourage these young boys and these young ladies. You know, it's not about how much you can get on your welfare check. You know, I, I have several soap operas, but anyways, you know, we just need to invite the people and encourage. Now, what I did do in, ooh, a few years ago, I would have like a meeting in my ward mm -hmm. and invite everybody in my ward who would come and participate. And it proved to be pretty good. We got things done over here, but they fussed so much. It was so hard to have a meeting without <laughs> so much negative dialogue, you know, but you, we can always do that, but just to, you know, and, and, and even for our people, I just think that we need people of color just need to show up and stand up and we need to be able to communicate. I mean, communicate well, not Ebonic, <laughs> okay? You know, and, that, and that's just the nature of the beast. You know, you have to present in order to get. Yes. You know, because they're looking at that and they're looking at us. So, but anyways. Thank you, I thank hope you. That little bit has helped, okay. Yes, ma'am, that, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. And we're wrapping that portion up, but thank you. That, that was very helpful just to recap what you said was getting involved with on commissions that are opening, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, raising up people, just being able to share, getting our, our young men and women involved. I mean, you opened up a whole nother portion talking about the welfare system and the complacency in that, about our young men being involved in felonies and misdemeanors. And I mean, that's, again, I'm very passionate about that because we it, we have to have people uh, that look like us. I mean, young people should have models that they can touch that are doing something positive and not just the sports heroes, not just the latest rap star. I mean, people in their community that that look like them, they, they can strive to, that they can ask questions, that can mentor them. And I'm going to stop because I'm very passionate. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that uh, for that you shared. And Miss Jackie, again, thank you for holding down. You do a wonderful job in, in the community. So thank you, uh, Miss Jackie Council, uh, Miss J Jackie Campbell, council person, Ward 1, Luling, Texas. We appreciate you, ma'am. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Oh, great, thank you uh, very much, you all, for listening. Now, we're not done yet, because now we have one more topic that's very important. We're going to be talking about health in the Black community. Uh, the last 10 minutes is geared towards health and the Black community, and then we're going to open up for questions for, to all the panel. Let me bring our last but not least. Uh, Whitney Houston said, I think it was Whitney Houston. She says, you go and save the best for last. Right? And, uh, excuse my singing. But we have someone I'm very proud of, another person I'm very proud of, another young lady who just had a birthday upon yesterday. So happy birthday to you, Miss Zuper. She is studying to be a doctor in her third year medical student, a specialty in obst uh, obstetrics and gynecology, working in the hospital. We were so glad she was able to fit us in her schedule. We appreciate you, ma'am. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to get ready to bring channel Miss Zuper Sabri, I think I'm saying your name right. Miss Sabri Zuper, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being on the call. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's hear from our health professional. Hi, everyone, and thank you all for having me tonight. Um, yes, I, I had a birthday yesterday, so yes, I'm glad that I could um, be able to do this today. Um, being able to talk about this is just as much as a gift as anything else I could receive because it's very important that you know, we talk about what's going on in our community, you know, whether we're talking about Caldwell, where we're talking about Atlanta, Houston, Detroit, which is where I'm from, wherever, you know, um, it's very important that we talk about our health. And so, um, yes, my name is Sabri Zuper. I'm in my, thir um, my third year of medical school and I will be graduating next year. So I will be a doctor. Um, but one of the things I think that has pulled me to medicine is the history of it, the history of how it relates to our people, you know, especially in this country in particular. Um, a lot of the times we weren't afforded the care that we needed. And so we had to figure out how we were gonna take care of ourselves. Um, and so there, that unfortunately, uh, the healthcare community within the United States uh, unfortunately has stemmed or uh, stimulated a mistrust within the black community, within communities of color. Um, oftentimes because community co of colors, um, sorry, 
uh, communities of color were targeted, unfortunately, from um, different healthcare uh, people, different healthcare communities, pharmaceutical companies, researchers, and you know, and it's it's just perpetuated a mistrust. Um, so I, I think that it's really important that we understand, you know, where we are, why we are where we are, but where we can go, right? So people like me who are younger, who are coming into this, understanding the history and the heritage, but also trying to take on, you know, the burden of pushing, you know, for our communities to be healthier, for our communities to have the information, the access, you know, uh, so that we can thrive. You know, that's, that's what I'm here to do. So I think the first thing I really wanna talk about is the importance of education within our community. I mean, that has been a hot topic all night, education, 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 education. It is truly the most important thing to be able to understand and interpret information and be able to make decisions based on that information. Unfortunately, a lot of our communities don't really have access to that information. And so they lack the ability to make a, a good or just decision for themselves and for their families. Um, some of the major things that the African-American community really struggles with is heart health, is diabetes, high, you know, high blood pressure, um, you know, just kidney issues, things like that. These are things that if you tackle them on early on in your life where you have knowledge about what to do, we wouldn't have so many people that have chronic kidney disease or that have failing hearts or congestive heart failure or COPD or things that can actually be taken care of early on if we had the access, if we had the information. Um, but again, a lot of that stems from that this disconnect between our hospital systems and our clinics and our doctors and you know, and our, and our patients. And so one of the things that I've done with my life is to um, invest in holistic care. So when I, when I graduate, I'll be a DO. And so a DO is a doctor of osteopathic medicine, which is, we're still physicians, we do surgeries, we're in the hospitals, um, but it's a little bit of a different philosophy from allopathic medicine, which MDs practice. So I wanted to practice osteopathic medicine because it teaches you that the body can actually heal itself, that all you have to do is partner with it, partner with your patient and work with them, look at their mentality, look at their socioeconomic status, look at their ability to um, understand and, and interpret the information correctly so that they can have better healthcare outcomes. So these are things that I, I, I'm like very passionate about. Um, especially education, because when you know better, you do better. When you know to eat better, when you know to exercise, when you know to go see the doctor, when you feel like something is off, instead of just trying to continue and go on about your days and then your weeks and then your months and then your years, and then you look up and you're in the emergency department and they're telling you that you're at stage four kidney disease and you need kidneys, you know, then you know, we, can, we can make better decisions. So the reason why I think education is important is just that, so that we can stop this generational thing of not being able to go to the doctor or trust the doctor, but actually be able to see ourselves working with them and partnering with them. Another thing that I think is really important that um, Shanice touched on, and she did an excellently, excellent presentation, was representation. A lot of the doctors that we see don't look like us. They don't understand our families. They may not understand the way we talk, the way we learn, the way we, one of the things that I love that she talked about was physics. There was a whole nother language of trying to understand what that was and coming into it. It was a different language, you know, it was a different way of communicating. It was academia, you know, and a lot of us that come into that world and we have to learn it, right? Well, it's the same thing with medicine. Medicine is a whole nother community, a whole nother language. And so when you're trying to relate to your patient and you have no idea their background, their culture, their language, their understanding, their emotion, or how they express themselves, then there's a disconnect. So a doctor may have the intent to help the patient, but they have no idea how to relate to this patient because they, don't, they haven't been trained in diversity, equity, and inclusion. They don't have that exposure. And so one of the things that I think is really important for our communities to do is to foster pipeline, that pipeline programs is what they're called, where we go and we talk to students. I mean, talking to, I've talked to students as low as, as young as uh, kindergarten, 
just introducing them to what a doctor is, what they do, what are the things that they talk about and the things that they see every day. Just, just instituting that from that age and on, making sure that our students have that type of access and that type of representation to see a black female doctor and a black girl talking to each other, she can envision herself. That's actually how I got through college. I saw black women in biology graduate before me and then I was like, huh, I can do that. And I did. And so it's really important that we continue to foster pipeline communities in our in our elementary schools, in our medical school, our middle schools, high schools, so that they can get to college, so that they're they're exposed already to this type of language, to this type of understanding. Um, making sure that we have people like Shanice coming to these schools and talking to them. Um, and people like me. I'm a mentor. I love to mentor and I love to make sure that people see themselves in me or whatever I'm doing or whatever I'm able to do. And so one of the organizations that I actually joined when I came to medical school is called the Student National Medical Association. Um, it's the student version of the National Medical Association. So back in the day, the AMA or the American Medical Association didn't allow African American doctors to become a part of their organization. So the NMA was started and then the SNMA was started, uh, the student version. And so one of the things that we really emphasize is creating or um, helping to stimulate more clinically excellent, culturally competent and socially conscious doctors. So we are pumping out you know, different students in different schools so that we have these pipeline programs vamping up so that there's representation at the level of elementary school and up because it starts there. It starts as young as you can possibly get to a student. Um, and so that's one of my passions, um, but that's also, I, I think a really good benefit that would really help this community, this county, um, is making sure that we're uh, talking to our students about their future and also helping them to see that they do have one, that there is one for them uh, beyond what they may understand or know. So, a little bit about um, my uh, myself. So uh, I really am interested in obstetrics and gynecology and specifically working with African-American women. Um, unfortunately, right now we are the highest to uh, statistically to die in labor and delivery um, because of various biases, uh, various lack of understanding of care, um, and lack of diversity, equity, inclusion um, within our like residency programs and even really within our medical schools. And so not only do I wanna be an obstetrician and be able to seek to serve my, my women or my, my community of women, but I also wanna be a part of the training and education of the future physicians of tomorrow. So not only do we need to see African-American, Hispanic, Asian, Native American people in these fields, in these specialties of medicine, but we also need to be in the root of their education. That is what I'm like purpose to do. Uh, one of my mentors or one of my uh, idols, I should say, uh, is uh, Dr. Barbara Ross Lee. She is the first and only African-American dean of a medical school, period, ever, that has ever been. And she's also Diana Ross's sister. And she is a DO as well. And so I see myself in her shoes because it's important that not only black people like myself in medical school or Hispanics, but white students as well get used to and exposed to and understand uh, various cultures, various uh, understandings of various uh, languages. How do we relate to our patient population? How do we get over this hump of them versus us and just become a we, a community. Um, I think that's, that's vital. Um, so education and also just being able to be in the space of medicine itself. So those are a few of my um, points that I just wanted to introduce myself on. I had a few other points, but David, I, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to jump in if you wanted to. Appreciate it. Thank you. You know, you're doing a great job. I, I want to ask a question. If you want to touch one more point, you can. Um, one question that has, has come up just kind of right here. First of all, congratulations. You're doing amazing and so proud of you. I know uh, you, you have roots in Caldwell County just a little bit because I know you. And so we, you know, we, we go, we, we have some relationships. So that's how you're here in Caldwell County. But my question is um, with COVID-19, uh, right. 
that's relevant, and you may touch on this in your next point. Um, let's see, I, the question was, in your field of, in area of, of expertise, what are you learning and hearing about COVID-19 and about what's going on? So you can share a little bit about that and then whatever else you wanna share. Well, number one, I think one of the biggest things that's come to my attention is that it's disproportionately affecting our communities. Why is that? Why is this virus that no one has ever heard of from China coming here and affecting and killing our women and men in our communities? What is going on? And a lot of it has to go, has to deal with that access to care, that understanding of what's going on and being able to trust the information that is coming to you that is, that is actually for you and going to help you. And again, that mistrust, I believe, has also played a part into why we see the numbers that we do. Um, not just in our community, but I mean, just also generally within our nation, we still have people that walk around without masks on because they don't believe that this virus is real, um, even though it's killed millions of people all over the world. So I think right now when I hear COVID-19, I hear, I hear that we need to be cautious and I hear that we need to be careful and we, that we need to protect our own. We need to wear masks we need to stay indoors. We need to not travel as much. We need to make sure that we're paying attention to whatever signs or whatever our body is trying to communicate because your body will let you know when something is off, right? So just staying in tune with, your, with yourself and making sure that you are protecting yourself. Uh, one of the things that I was just discussing with my mother was an article about cloth masks. A lot of people are buying masks that, um, you know, they can put on, it's decorative, it's cute, but a lot of the times uh, we're not washing these masks every day. So we're going out and we're reusing these masks every day, but one of the things we need to do is make sure that we are using um, masks that are clean. So just something as simple as that, you know, starting, so I just have a box of blue masks, the hospital masks that we wear, wear one every day. New one every day, new one every day, throw out the old ones, things like that, washing your hands um, and trying to limit as much contact as we can um, with, with um, you know, going out, going to the stores. And I know people that are still going to bars, you know, like we don't live in normal times as, as much as we, as, as fatigued as we are, just we have to still be very cautious and proceed uh, with wisdom in this time and discernment. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, that's great information. Um, sorry, I took you off for a second. Um, great information. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, and I want you to stay on. Don't go anywhere just yet. Uh, uh, let's see. There we go. Got you back. Don't go anywhere just yet. Just want to um, open it up for questions. Um, and, and we'll start to the whole panel. Um, and then I do want to say this. Now we're at about 720. We're about uh, almost two hours and 20 minutes in. And, and, and we've only scratched the surface on just a lot of these topics. And so thank you, thank you, thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, most of you all have stayed on the line for, 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 a, for a while. So we appreciate it. It's been a, 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 but a discussion. I need a discussion, even the things, you know, I have to be guilty. I don't always wash my cloth mask every day, you know, but to be honest, my wife just washed like three of mine today. So, so I, I'm, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. But that is information that is needed, that is needed. So thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for sharing uh, with young women. I mean, I have my daughter is 12. And so I'm gonna, if she's not watching now, I'm gonna make sure she watches <laughs> She watches Shanice. She watches you, and she. That's I'm making sure she's watching that, you know. But thank you so much for your heart to serve um, in our community. I'm going to pause for a second, open up uh, for questions. Um, but as I do, I want to make sure that we. Uh, I'm going to have you come back here in about a few minutes and share any last points. But want to make sure that we open up for questions before anyone has to drop off of the of the call. Um, I will say this. I took some notes. Uh, all over this my my notepad. Let me say this one thing that she, uh, that Sabri mentioned was for people of color. Now this conversation, it's been titled "Black Voices in Caldwell County," but what the information that has been shared today is just not for for black people. It's for for people in general, for a community. For it's for the we, as she mentioned. It's for the we. Sometimes we have to have these conversations, and not just. Because black people, people of color have been mistreated, have been, their systemic racism is 
real. And we have to just acknowledge that. If we don't acknowledge that in our county, in our region, in our schools, then how do we move forward? It's like Ms. Jackie Campbell said, moving away and then coming back and still dealing with the same prejudice, prejudice this, or she didn't say that, but the same old, same old. Y'all, there has to be move, room to proceed. So this conversation is needed. We have to talk about these things, not from a place of hate, from, from just to bring it up to the surface so we know, so we can do better. So our students aren't, are, aren't skipped over. So we don't, I mean, so we make sure that we're providing the best we can for our entire community, not having rocks in our jaws because we've been discriminated against. Okay, it happens, but how do we move forward? How do we continue to treat our neighbor with love despite what's, what our history says, right? How do we get our black students in school to want to know about uh, history, to want to know about the physics and so forth? How do, we, how do we stop highlighting white and Caucasian and European heroes and start highlighting heroes of color so people in school, kids in school, can see themselves in the heroes, the queens, the kings, and the people of color that has sustenance in this community? So this is important to hear, important to, to have conversations from here and to have a line of action. As you can tell, I'm passionate about this subject, so I'll stop talking, but I will ask a few questions. So if you have to drop off the call, we appreciate it so much. Don't, um, after the questions, we have a segment called wrapping up, where do we go from here? Now, what now? So I'm gonna ask a few questions that have been typed into the comment on Facebook and in this discussion page. But before we go, we have a, a section called What Now? David, after we have this discussion, what do we do? So you don't want to miss that. If you can stay for that, I, I ask that you stay for that. So a question that came up was, was for Miss Martin. Okay, uh, Miss Miss Martin, now I see more questions coming in. So uh, Miss Tanaya, for ECI, the question is this. As uh, do you guys provide mental health care for elementary students in the foster care system or uh, with students in foster care, do you provide mental health for um, from students that are zero to three in foster care? That was a question posed in the chat. Yes, we do. We have our uh, counselor who uh, provide that service. So if, if we have a, a child that needs some mental health um, guidance, then we, would, we will um, put our counselor on that. Um, plan for that child. Awesome, awesome. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. So the, uh, thank you for that, that answer. I know Shanice took a question on Facebook as well uh, with Mr. Lloyd. I think she answered that very well on Facebook. Uh, that was simply, I'm just, I'll just restate it. She already shared the answer, but it was, um, what can I do for kids uh, to get kids to reach out for, scholar for more scholarships? And she answered that question in the chat. Uh, if you want to briefly touch on that, you can, uh, Shanice. And then another one for you, Shanice, is this. What can we do to get more kids to take advanced courses or take them more seriously? What can we do to get more of our students to take advanced courses and take those uh, more seriously? So those are a couple of questions for you um, if you want to answer that. And then we have a question for Ms. Jackie Campbell coming as well. So my past mentor, his name was F. King Alexander, or President F. King Alexander. He worked with LSU. He was the president and chancellor at the time during my undergrad career. He always used to preach and always used to say that the college admissions thought or the, just the thought of college starts at sixth grade. And I absolutely believe that. It is knowing that we have a very diverse community, but never ever excluding everybody within that community to the different options or to the different opportunities that are open. So yes, it is starting that that is starting that talk early. It is discussing, you know, the whole realm of what high school or what um, life after college could or life after high school could possibly look like, even at such a young age of sixth to seventh grade. It just, it's just for the idea if it gets them ready, it gets them, it gets them into that thought process, especially because now I know that the changes within Lockhart ISD, students are now having to pick tracks, selecting tracks in order to, you know, continue and get their degree or get their, you know, GED or equivalents to that, you know, um, in, in the future. But if we are only starting that conversation in the two weeks that, or in the, I'm sorry, four months before they go into high school, are we 
we really preparing them for what could possibly go? And then of course, we have four years of high school where we could prepare them for college. However, if we aren't setting into their heads that this is a possibility when they are young, there's no possible way that they're going to think that this is a possibility when they are in high school. So that's number one. Number two is also opening up the fact um, of those AP honors classes and maybe even helping um, bridge the gap a little bit as far as um, the more students that we retain in or the more students that we, I guess, offer invitation to as far as those classes go. Usually for, and I know for me, I had a very set group of friends. And the reason why is because our AP classes were pretty much the same. Nobody else really came in. It was the same group of students. We all did NHS together. We all did everything together. And I feel like we were handpicked and selected at a very young age when we first all started together. And there was no growth. There was no ad. There was no, okay, students, if you would like to sign up for this, what is the difference? What is the course rigor, et cetera, and so forth. So it's, again, being really, I guess, um, transparent to all of our students and about the different opportunities that they have, but then also even more so teaching them that AP dual enrollment is not the only way for success, that students are still getting into college without any of these advanced placement classes. Students are still getting into all, all that is truly needed at this point is, 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 is the correct grades. Even more so, we see students who are concerned about their freshman sophomore level grades College admissions processes are going less towards, I guess you could say, um, test scores and GPA and more towards holistic review, more towards what did you do in your community? What type of clubs and organizations were you a part of? What leadership opportunities did you do as well? And is there an upward trending grade? Because like I try to reason with parents, the student that you are your freshman year of high school is not going to be the student that you're going to be your freshman year of college. The more than likely it's going to be the student that you are your, your senior year of high school and, and over. So it's teaching them that no matter what, even if you find yourself making a mistake at the very beginning, there is room for improvement. And then even more so, there are different possibilities and to get to different ways um, as well. It's all about how we speak and treat our students more so and allowing them to grow. They don't have to stay stagnant. If they want to bridge into these AP programs, then they should be able to do so. Um, another thing that I did see in there, and I do want to make it public, is the fact that we've had a lot of issues, I guess, with students who are varsity players not being able to take AP classes. And that's absolutely unacceptable. I understand that resources are low. However, what these other schools are doing is they're simply just putting more time and money. They are working after hours. I work after hours every single day um, for my students with my high school and I'm talking to counselors full, from 4, 6, 7 p.m. at night about their students. So it's all about initial effort, you guys, and really putting out effort for your students the day these different colleges and these different universities will come to you as long as we start to put the effort into our children and then we in turn say okay let's start going to these colleges let's start visiting not exclusively just these four-year universities let's go even look at these community colleges see what these trade colleges offer let's see what the entire kind of scope is as a whole so yes yeah, so the biggest thing and I'll kind of circle back to end it is how we speak and how we approach our students at the very beginning this does start at sixth grade it's all about self-esteem if we start telling our students that they will not get anywhere then that is exactly where they are going to go and that is currently honestly what we are seeing at this moment it is time for teachers to really sit down in that role as an educator and really give these students the hope that they are looking for and I understand that it can be tough because this generation is tough Gen Z is one that I, I, I'm in I'm in the middle. I like to say that I'm not a part. I'm not a part of Gen Z, but but I can understand they're they're a tough group of students. So the way that we approach them needs to be a little bit different than the way that we are used to. It is now time to kind of look at the view as a whole and to know that our old teachings are no longer working anymore. That's that's great information. I, I love it. I love it. Um, just one stat that I'm reminded of as a dad is that. Um, that students that students that visit college, you know, like as a middle school or high school, are is more apt to go to college. They're able to take that visit. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So for my seventh grade father, thank you for sharing what you just shared. Um, we have one more question for Miss Jackie Campbell, and then another. Uh, we're going to throw it to back to Sabri Zuper to to share one more thing that's very important. Um, and then I have also one question for the Williams and that might wrap things up. I, I'm trying my best to be a good student over your time while at the same time not to diminish all the great momentum that has been going forth thus far. So we're gonna go to Ms. Jackie Campbell for a question back to Dr. the soon to be Dr. Zuper. And then we'll go back to the Williams for a word of advice from Mr. Homer, Ms. Shirley Williams. So question is for Councilperson uh, Campbell. 
the question is posed uh, for you. Why do you think, uh, let me do this real quick. Um, why do you think minorities don't vote in our community? What is your comment based off what you've seen? Why do you think minorities are less likely to vote uh, in our communities? And if you could unmute yourself, if you don't mind, uh, and share that once again. Okay. Ignorance and stupidity. First, oh gosh, I don't even want to say some of the things that I've heard. You know, if I vote, I'll have to go to jury duty. Okay. You, education, everything goes back to education, you know, but you just have some that, and you know, even with this past election, well, I don't like either one of them, and I'm not voting for either one of them. It's like, well, well, think about the, the least of the two, which, which one, you know, vote, you know, and, and you know, even in ex explaining how and what it took for black people to vote, you know, all we can do is educate. That's the big word, educate, because so many of our people are already registered to vote. I remember years ago when I was running for uh, something, but anyways, uh, and Somebody told me they were going to vote for me. Oh, I'm going to vote for you because they weren't even registered. <laughs> this is why I'm saying ignorance. But that was a long time ago. Hopefully they've been educated by now. Yeah. But we just have to teach them. We just have to teach people, period. Yeah. Bottom line. Bottom mm. line. That, 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 that's good. Uh, I, I love it. I probably wouldn't have said it, but I'm going to say it now. Ignorance and stupidity. <laughs> 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 thank you, thank you, thank you for that answer, and thank you for elaborating. Great, great answer. Um, I want to send it to back to uh, Sabri for a, another important comment, and then after she makes uh, this this comment, it's a very important important point that is very needed in our community. We have a question for the Williams family as well. So, uh, Miss Sabri is coming back to to us to share one more, uh, to share another topic. Yes, so my last and final thing that I really wanted to say, um, one of the things I discussed were some of the more prominent issues that we see within our, our community, heart health, kidney health, lung health, um, blood pressure. But one of the things that I really wanted to echo, and I, I can't remember who shared uh, this earlier, but it is mental health. It is mental health. Mental health is a huge issue in our community. I mean, and if this, if you've gone through this whole year and you haven't seen how important it is to, to, to make sure that you're centered, to make sure that you are, uh, you're connected to your community, that you are uh, making sure that you are anchored, whatever you're anchored in, whether it's your faith, whether it's your hobbies, whether it's working out, whatever it is, like those things matter to, to the health of our community as well. I did not want to get off of this call without saying that it is important imperative that we make sure that we are checking in with our brains just as much as we are with our hearts and our and our blood pressures and our kids your brain is a part of your body too right so if something is off with that that's also going to affect the rest of your health as well um, i think it was miss holland that said that who spoke about that um so i just wanted to just echo that and to just encourage everyone as we're closing with this year to just be able to check in and be honest with yourself about where you are with taking care of yourself mentally, right? One of the things I love that they say when you're on the plane is before you, like if we're ever in a, an emergency situation, before you try to mask yourself, mask anybody else, mask yourself, mask yourself, make sure you have the oxygen that you need before you go and share whatever you can with the people around you. That includes your, your, your mind, your, your spiritual health, your community, like everything that you need that, that makes you who you are, that makes you sane, that makes you whole. Um, those things, they do impact your, your, your physical health, but they also impact the people around you. So I just wanted to put that out there and encourage everyone that it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to speak up and, and share about those moments in your life as well. Thank you. I love that. I love that. Thank you. Thank you, Sabri. It's okay to not be okay. Uh, also, you said, what are you anchored in? Okay, because I was taking notes. And then check in with your brain, just like you check in with your heart. That's that's so very important. Thank you for sharing that. 
uh, even as a man, you know, I, t- I tell our dads, be, I have to be self-aware of what we're going through, right? How am I feeling? I remember uh, when my mom passed, who was a great woman here in Caldwell County. One day I was fixing some pies and I, I don't feel like fixing pies. Why? Because I had to check in with me because my pies reminded me of my mom. So I had to take a mental health moment, cry for a second and then continue, right? Check in with yourself. So I love it. Thank you for sharing. We have another question coming from uh, to the Williams family. And then there's been a question for uh, another question for Shanice. Again, I'm trying to make sure that I'm being respectful of your time. So I do understand if you have to drop off the call, um, we're going to be ending shortly. I do understand if you need to know that this is all being recorded. It's all streaming right now live on Facebook. And if you know Facebook, you can go back to the replay. We're also recording this for future endeavors. And by the way, this would not be the last conversation that we bring this to you in this format. So my question is coming to the Williams family. Uh, we appreciate your wisdom. Uh, we appreciate you. My question is, jotted it down for the Williams family. Um, let me bring you on the screen really quickly if I can. There we go. Uh, what, what advice do you have based off your experience, um, Williams family, uh, based off your knowledge, what advice do you have for today's generation? Because you've seen some things, you've been through some things, you've seen even your, the elders in your family, your grandparents have shared some things with you from their wisdom back in the late 1800s and so, and so forth. So what advice do you have for us in today's generation? If you can share that, I would greatly appreciate it. The advice I would have for the young ones that's coming along now would be keep yourself clean. Sometimes you hang with your own crowd and uh, <clears throat> you need to get your job and go to work and make you some money and don't spend all your money in one place because <laughs> tomorrow is going to come. A lot of people say, well, live today and, and let every day take care of itself. But what if you're living tomorrow and you ain't got nothing? And with the friends that you got now, they ain't going to give you nothing. The generation now looks at it. If I can use you, I use it. But when I use you up, I'm through with you. So keep yourself clean. Get you a job. Go to work. Don't stay at home and take off a day because you're sick and you're not. Uh, all those things will catch up with you. And people watches you. If you're good working for someone else, you might be able to get you a better job that way. Just climb the ladder. I always went to work on one job, trying to make uh, 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 another job available that paid more money until I got to the point to where I had a uh, pretty nice job plus insurance and all of the things that I needed to make a, to live a good life. Thank you, sir. That's very valuable information. Ms. Williams, did you have anything else to add or did, did, did Mr. Williams share it, share what you're, yes, you're saying? I do have something to say. Thank you. And thank all of you that have been on. Everything has been wonderful. You, Shanice, you know what I think. I love you and I'm so proud of you. But what I want to say to all young people of this generation, stay focused, stay prideful, and get you an education. But getting that education, you need support from your parents. I say to parents, support your children. Don't be afraid to go to that school and talk about your children. Listen to your children. When they come home, I always told my children, you don't try to handle anything at that school. Don't take our job away from us. Bring it to us and let us go to the school and handle it because you can't handle it. I always give that advice. I always say, and when I talk to young parents, I tell them, you go, take care of your children. Listen to them. I, I wish my, our daughter, Dr. Deidre Williams, could have been on today because she would have a story to tell how hard it was for her as I listened to Shanice about those classes. It was, they'll try to keep you from those classes, but you need to let your parents know when they're trying to keep you from those classes. Every parent need to talk to their children and find out what's going on in the school. You need to go. Every parent need to go to the school. We are small in number in these schools these days, but it doesn't mean we don't have a voice. And to have a voice, you have to go. And you have to not go with an attitude because they won't listen to you. 
go with like you're a that you it's the end of your child's life and you are there to take care of it right then and there. Education is very important, but kids, I listened to her talk about how her parents was very supportive and what they, she didn't have to worry. Kids shouldn't have to worry about fighting for an education. They should, a, I would love to see Lockhart have a strong parental involvement, a strong where parents would come together discuss what's going on and be strong together and going trying to take care of some things. There are things still going on, but you may not have parents that can have the strength to go or the wisdom or don't wanna go. But sometimes you just, we just need to be there for, I would say, be there for your children. Thank you, Shanice, for being an advocate for the kids trying to get them in college and trying to make sure they have, but there are others here that's also doing that. And I appreciate them, but we ourselves need to be there for our children. Have love. I was a praying person for my kids. Yes. I was a praying person for my kids before they, when they went to bed at night, when I got up in the morning and when they got ready to go outside of school or whatever. I, and that's what we have to do. And I'll shut up so before I get. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Williams, for your knowledge, your wisdom, and insight. That is so very, so very valuable. I'm glad that question was asked because that information needed to be heard. So thank you once again for sharing uh, that wisdom uh, for, for us. Now, I do want to say this. I have a question for you all as we get ready to bring things to a close. I want to thank you so much for being on. There's one more question we're going to ask, but my question to you as a listening audience is this. Two things that I just want to know personal. Since I have the microphone, I'll go ahead and talk. Okay. <laughs> First question is this. Um, uh, what are, if you don't mind, you can always message me personally if you don't want to share this in the chat. But are there, what are some Black-owned businesses here in Caldwell County that, that exist? I'm just kind of making a list because I believe, one, this is my belief. I believe we should support shop local as much as possible in Lockhart, Caldwell County. I believe that to kind of keep our economic uh, system going to keep those small businesses in business. I believe that to shop local as much as possible. I also believe that we should as much as possible support um, as a black person, support black owned businesses. As minority, not, not just shop locally ex exclusively there, but be able to support our community. You know, same thing with minorities. The same thing, locally owned businesses. And then also, I want to support my uh, uh, people of color as well. That's just me personally. So my question is, are there, what are some of the black owned businesses in the area? You can put it in the comments below, or you can always Facebook me. I'm just kind of trying to compile some so we can um, ha have that available because I want to make sure that we're supporting. There's more people like me that may not know of all the black owned businesses that, that can use businesses. For example, some people don't know what I do and I do, and I have my own business. I'm not going to I'm not going to share about that right now, but I do have a business. And so we can have more people supporting local, period. Not just black owned, although that's nice, but local, period. We don't always highlight the local businesses. Question number one. Question number two for you all is this. And then I have one more question for Shanice, and that'll be our last question, okay? Um, question number two is this. Are there any organizations? Let me, I, I jotted it down. Here it goes. What are the organizations in our county that's geared towards helping advance the black community and people of color. Are there any organizations already that exist? And I'm gonna highlight one new one that just developed here in December, but are there any other organizations in our county that's geared towards helping uh, advance the black community or the minorities, people of color, period? Uh, because I wanna make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel. I wanna make sure that we have somebody, maybe they can operate it with this uh, uh, umbrella. They can do that. I want to make sure that we're working together as a community so we can have a voice, as Ms. Jackie said, so we can stand up and show up and move the needle. It's time to make sure that we're moving the needle, that uh, that we're coming together as a community, that it's not just singling somebody out, but it's the we, that we are saying we are here and, and, and we can make a difference. Okay, so if you have that, you can always message me later. My last question for Shanice, and I think you answered it, Shanice, but I want to make sure that you understand this. I see some comments coming in. Thank you for that, Miss Larry. 
Uh, my last question for Shanice, I think you answered it, but here it is. It is regarding admissions, I think. Let me go back up and find it. All right, bear with me for a second. Here it goes, it's going, it's going, and there it is. So here's the question. So scholarships passed over our black and brown students and the counselors ignore and gave help to white students? Is that a correct assumption? I believe when you were speaking, Ms. Sh uh, Shanice, you mentioned that. So the question once again is, so am I hearing you right? They said, so did the scholarships were they passed over from black and brown students by the counselors and or by the counselors and uh, they helped the white students instead during your tenure? Yes, actually. In fact, a lot of the scholarships and all that I found out about, I found out after the fact. In fact, at Louisiana State University, there's a couple of really cool things that happen. Number one, we have a multicultural affairs program that actually does an overnight program that actually pays for black scholars to start early during the summer. Um, my guidance counselor did not help me with that. And, or not, I wouldn't even say my guidance counselor because my high school counselor was great. I'm gonna say the college or career coach did not help me with that. Um, and it absolutely hindered what I could have possibly or what community I could have possibly, you know, kind of went forward to and with um, during this time. It's all systematic. You think that gatekeeping education is not a thing? Um, it's absolutely a thing. In fact, one of the most terrifying things that I've ever had to do in 2020 is I went to a school in Louisiana that has not been integrated. You heard me correctly. They lost all federal funding because they refused to integrate their school doors. So they, for their entire time of being open, graduated nothing but white students. And that was probably one of the most terrifying experiences for me as a young African-American woman going there by myself. So just so you guys know, these are things that still happen. These are things that are still happening. Um, I know that there was also another question that I actually didn't answer that was just about like the counselors don't get it. How can we get them to get it? The biggest thing is number one, um, LSU does this really amazing thing to where we actually have counselor talks. Um, since you mentioned that, I actually went ahead and I texted one of my advisors, his name is Phil great, asked if we cannot um, open up a few spots for our high school counselors so that maybe they can come and speak to um, admissions counselors like myself and a couple of my other colleagues just about the college admissions process and how they can better support African American and student of color students. Um, but the biggest thing um, is like um, Ms. Williams said, is to be an advocate and to go there. The moment that your student steps onto a college campus, the 1974 FERPA law starts to take into place and you will not, no longer be able to be an advocate for your student. Your student will have to fight for themselves. But while you are now able to be a parent, now while your student is still a child within you know, the government's eyes, you need to utilize that and to the best of your ability before that is stripped away from you. You need to go speak to those counselors. I'm equally trying to do the same to where maybe I can have like a whole counselor talk. Um, obviously, you know, the one with LSU, but even a separate one to where they can come maybe even talk to me one-on-one -on -one just about the different discrepancies or the different things as African-American students we see. Um, but the biggest thing is to be unapologetic about the things that you say, because at the end of the day, these educators are servants to your students, or that's how they should look at this. Their job should not be looked at some type of privilege. It should be looked at as something that they want to do, that they take immense pride into doing. They are a servant to your student. So you need to take that quite literally. You need to go in there and you need to show and tell them all of the different things that you are expecting from them as guidance counselors, as, as individuals. At the end of the day, you guys, I don't ever want to bash Lockhart. The reason why I am putting this in such a light that I am and making it so public in the way that I am is because number one, I know from it about experience, I received probably maybe $3,000 from the Lockhart community. And that should tell you something that was only for my freshman year, which is quite sad. Um, so this is an experience that I've gone through by myself. And the only way that we could probably fix this issue is if we are unapologetic about the things that we say and how we say it. And at the end of the day, Lockhart is at the back end of the trail and it's, it's a sad realization that we need to go through. So um, transparency is everything, accessibility is everything. And I think that the first steps that we can make Ms. Lloyd and I'm gonna go ahead and do this for you is getting these counselors on that diversity call with Louisiana State Universities and with each of the admissions counselors. And maybe we can't help, you know, kind of show them what we're looking for in applications but even more so what we're looking at in students of color because we want that diversity. I know every college campus does. So that's that's going to be the first step. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Shanice, for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, that's so good. Um, and it's important. I mean, like you said, not bashing like our ISD, but at the same time, we, it's, it's important that we talk about these barriers, talk about what's uncomfortable so we can impact change. This, this, I mean, for example, if you had sugar-coated things, 
we wouldn't be having the impact and making the calls and the, back, the things that you're doing for our community. That wouldn't have happened had you not spoke to things directly. So thank you for uh, sharing these, these barriers and for everyone. So we're wrapping up. I want to say a big thank you. Before you go, I want to say what we're going to go do next. But before I do that, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much to Ms. Tanaya Martin from uh, ECI, from Blue Bonnet Trails. Thank you to Reverend Dr. Fritz Williams from First Baptist Church. Yes, sir. Thank you to Miss Wanda Holland. Um, by the way, she's a master trainer. You can reach out to her for training opportunity needs. Uh, and also the same thing with Miss Martin from ECI. Make sure, make sure you reach out to her. Uh, thank you to Mr. Sterling Riles, who said he was going to be a part. He has some things. He's on the road truck driving, so I thank you for his willingness. Thank you to Miss Jackie Campbell for just keeping it real. Sometimes you just got to keep it real. Thank you, Miss Jackie Campbell, for your service in the community. Thank you, thank you, thank you to Mr. and Mrs. Homer Williams. You guys are amazing. So much wealth, so much wisdom. Thank you for the fruit, even in your your children. They're they do well. Uh, just I, I can't say enough. So thank you to the Williams family. Thank you, Sabri Zuper. We're so proud of you, young lady. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to Reverend Sean Rivers of uh, Evan Baptist Church. Thank you to our our uh, MVP of the night, Miss Shanice, Shanice Manning. You're amazing. We love you. Thank you, thank you for your heart and the community. Thank you for your parents because you couldn't have got where you are without God. Parents. So thank you for that so much. Now, before we go, where do we go from here? Last question. Okay. Last question. Does high school have a career day, shadow day, college fair day? I'm going to, I have an answer for that in a moment. Okay. Last question. But before we do that, let me share my screen so I can make sure I've done my last part before we have possibly a last question. All right. So let me do this. Let me do this. Let me do this really quickly. All right. So where do we go from here? Okay. <laughs> we want to do what? Continue the, the discussion offline within your circle. So we've had a great conversation. One, point people to this conversation, be it your colleagues, be it your church, be it, uh, uh, officials in leadership, government, whatever that looks like, your children. This is on Facebook. It's saved for a replay. It's not going anywhere. I'm saving it on my computer so we can put it on YouTube as well. So revisit this conversation. Discuss this around your kitchen table with your students, with your kids. Advocate. Okay, it's important for the Black community, but it's, it's important for our community in Caldwell County, period. So we can have a better tomorrow. Um, number Next one. Uh, we talked about, talked about local organizations geared towards advancing this conversation and mentoring programs. So here's one local organization I do want to highlight. They're called Prep Lockhart. Okay, they're here in Caldwell County. They just launched, as of this month, uh, their Progress Rural Enrichment Program. You can find them on Facebook. Write them down. The Progress Rural Enrichment Program, they're based out of Lockhart here in Caldwell County, making some changes. They're looking at changing, I forgot my notes, but looking for making sure that they're keeping the data, okay? Because how can we speak to some of this, the situations that we're going through if we're just speaking from head knowledge, but we don't have the actual facts? They are committed to gathering the data about from the census, from different things that speaks to diversity and education and inclusion and the pe people of color. So they are an awesome organization. You can follow them on, on Facebook. Go ahead and like them, follow them so you can stay up to date with what they're going to be doing because they have some great things coming out in the future. Once again, that's Prep Lockhart Progress Rural Enrichment Project. Shout out to Executive Director, Ms. Larry. Awesome. I want to say this as well. We have uh, my business. I'm a business owner as well. I work a job. I wear a lot of hats, but one of my hats I wear is a business owner. My business, we're going to be walk, doing a mentoring program called Walking Into Manhood. That's right. Walking Into Manhood. We're going to be mentoring young men from junior high to high school. It's open to all young men, okay, people of color or not people of color. It's open to every young man that wants to be a part of it. We'll probably take 10 to 15, just to have how much we can handle through about a 26 to 52 week course. Okay, just mentoring them, connecting them, loving on them, using a curriculum called Dare to Be King. That's going to be launching, I believe, in January or February 2021. Once again, walking into manhood, a mentoring program. Okay, finally, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you for joining us for today's discussion. Now, people have said, what about what's happening next? So from here, we're going to do this again. We're going to do this again because a lot of things, we just kind of scratched the surface, right? We just, it's so much information that we could, I mean, y'all, it's already three hours. 
I, I started, I said, man, 90 minutes. It's been three hours. And that wasn't my intention, but it was just so good. I mean, you couldn't stop. So we're going to do this again in about a quarter, okay? And maybe February, March uh, area, we'll gather again. It might be one topic that we're really kind of dive into. It might be various panels again. I'm not sure, but we are going to do this again. We, this conversation needs to keep advancing. We need to keep coming back together to share what's best for our community. So thank you so very much. The last question that I want to make sure I'm trying to uh, be uh, accommodate you. Thank you for your compliments. I appreciate that. The last question is, does high school have a career day, a shadow day, or a college fair day? I know we have some admin, some administrators on the line, so that can be anybody's answer. Does our high school, be it Lockhart, be it Luling, be it Prairie Lee, do we have a career day, a shadow day, or college fair day? And I do know that Lockhart, because I was a speaker last in, I was a speaker in January to the Lockhart, uh, uh, Lockhart graduating class. So we do have a career day. We have a college day because I was their closing speaker. So I do know that. Um, but um, if anybody else has an answer, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to respond. I know I'm talking fast, but I'm going to be quiet right about now. Yes, they do have a college day. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Yes, LHS does have a college fair day. Thank you, Ms. Lloyd. Thank you, Ms. Williams, for that. We appreciate that. Talking fast because, again, I want to be mindful of your time. I think I covered everything. Thank you to all the city officials that joined us. Thank you to all the commissioners that joined us. Thank you to all the school officials that joined this conversation. Thank you to the pastors. Thank you to the mamas. Thank you to the daddies. Thank you to the students. Thank you, everybody. And most importantly, thank you to my wife for working behind the scenes. I appreciate you, love, Miss Mary Bryant. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Lampkin family for also monitoring the chat. We appreciate, appreciate you on Facebook. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to God because without him, none of this, y'all, would be possible. You all have a safe night. Have a Merry Christmas. Uh, don't forget to leave your info if you want to share it. Yes, if you want to share your information, I'm going to save the chat. So don't forget to leave your information if you want to share it. People can reach out to you. Shanice Manning has just left her email. She is an awesome, awesome resource in our community. So glad that she is with us. Um, thank you. Have a happy holiday. Be safe. Wash your hands, social distance. Uh, wash your mask, okay? That's something I have to be, do better with. Wash your, your cloth mask, okay? Uh, have a safe day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to be on for a little bit longer, for about another five minutes to save all the chat, to do the last minute touching of bases. But you all, we appreciate you all. God loves you. We're praying for you. And this conversation is not done. This is only the beginning. Have a great night. Appreciate you. Bye-bye.
Once again, we appreciate you all. I'm going to think about about another two minutes before I end the call. I just want to make sure you got all the final notes. If you need a little bit longer time, I'll definitely extend it to you. Uh, but just wanted to give you a verbal warning uh, that, that we're going to be um, ending the call. I have saved all the chat. This will be available for replay. But if you're still jotting down information, by all means, let me know so you can have the, all the time you need.